Good morning. Committee on the Judiciary, Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to prepare recesses of the subcommittee at any time. I welcome everyone to today's hearing on voter suppression and continuing threats to democracy. Before we continue, I'd like to remind all members that we have established an email address that previously shared and distribution list dedicated to circulating exhibits, motions, or other written materials that members want to offer as part of our hearing today. I also ask unanimous consent that our committee colleague, Representative Lucy McBath of Georgia, be allowed to participate in today's hearing, and that she permitted to ask questions should a subcommittee member yield her time. Without objection, so done. Finally, I would ask all members and witnesses to mute your microphones when you are not speaking. This will help prevent feedback and other technical issues. You may unmute yourself anytime you seek recognition. I'll now recognize myself for an opening statement. Earlier this past week, the nation commemorated the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King on Saturday and his National Day of Honor, Dr. Martin Luther King Day, which we owe a great debt of gratitude to our previous chairman, John Conyers, who labored for that, I think, 15 or 16 years but to make it become law on Monday, Dr. Martin Luther King Day. And it was right as a country that we do that. And it was right of John Conyers to initiate the idea and to continue persistently and doggedly to make sure it happened. Many public figures and office holders gave speeches and statements to honor Dr. King's legacy of leadership. And some of them went further to talk about what his leadership was about to ensure civil rights for all Americans, to make us a better nation. But to truly honor Dr. King, and in the way that I hear in church so often, to paraphrase, to be of Dr. King and not just about Dr. King, we must defend the most fundamental right that he fought to secure for Black Americans and other historically oppressed people, the right to vote. Yes, he was for the right to organize and have workers compensated properly and recognized being part of a union. And he was for health care as a basic civil right and for peace and for equitable treatment of all people. But the right to vote was the fundamental linchpin upon which it all rested. In his 1957 speech in May of 1957, he said, quote, the denial of this sacred right is a tragic betrayal of the highest mandates of our democratic tradition. And so our most urgent request to the President of the United States and every member of Congress is to give us the right to vote. Give us the ballot, and we will no longer have to worry the federal government about our basic rights. May of 1957, 65 years ago. Distressingly, those words from 1957 apply today, just as aptly as they did the moment that uh, he made the speech, and it does as this moment that we live. As large segments of our nation's political and governing class appear ready to retreat from what had been a, a longstanding bipartisan commitment to protecting multiracial democracy since the enactment of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It's impossible to think of the Voting Rights Act without thinking of our dear colleague, John Lewis. We all miss greatly. John Lewis, in the first march from Selma, was beaten and almost gave his life for the right to vote. Dr. King led the second March, when the government came in and made sure it was successful rather than it was unsuccessful. The people went to Selma with Dr. John Lewis for his moralizations of the march, his memory of the march, and people went and were touched and spoke about it, how they went with John Lewis to Selma. And then some of those same people voted not to continue the Voting Rights Act that he nearly gave his life for. That's named for him, the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act. As this subcommittee is documented exhaustively through 13 hearings over the course of the last three years, voting rights for Black Americans, Latino Americans, Native Americans, Asian Americans, disabled Americans, and other historically disadvantaged groups have once again come under significant threats in many parts of our country. The extensive record we built through those hearings showed that many states have adopted laws making absentee voting harder, reducing opportunities for early voting, and closing polling locations at predominantly minority precincts, among other things. 
According to the Brennan Center for Justice, between January 1 and December 7, 2021, more than 440 bills with provisions that restrict voting access have been introduced in 49 states in the 2021 legislative sessions. These are the most, quote, extraordinary, unquote, numbers that the Brennan Center has seen in any year since it began tracking voting legislation in 2011. Disturbingly, since 2020, we have also seen states changing their election administrative laws and processes to politicize the counting of votes already cast. Vladimir Putin has said it's important, most important, who counts the votes. In some cases, these measures could allow partisan actors to interfere with vote counts or even overturn the results. Beyond these already troubling trends is the fact that this redistricting cycle was the first one without the Voting Rights Act preclearance provision in effect. The results were predictable. For example, in Georgia, several lawsuits have been filed challenging the state's new congressional legislative maps, alleging that they violate Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act by denying Black voters the equal opportunity to participate in the political process and elect their candidates of choice by diluting the strength of their voters and their votes. These maps also strip minority elected officials of power by targeting their districts for elimination. In Tennessee, Congressman Cooper's district was divided into three different districts. And instead of being a district with 28% minority impact, it now is a district with 12%. And the remaining 16% are scattered through two other predominantly rural precincts where there will be 16% black vote and 10% black vote. Notably, people of color accounted for all of Georgia's population growth between 2010 and 2020, the time when the state's white population declined. Yet its redistricting plan has not only failed to capture this fact, but actively sought to remove minority voters from majority minority districts and place them in the majority white districts. Cracking is what that's called. In Texas, the Department of Justice filed a lawsuit to challenge the state's redistricting plans as violations of Section 2 as well. Texas created two new majority white congressional districts, eliminated a Latino opportunity district, and failed to create a district capturing the growth of the Latino electorate in Harris County, all despite the fact that 95% of the population growth in Texas between 2010 and 2020 was a result of growth in its minority population. We will hear from our witnesses today about many other examples of how states besides Georgia, Texas, and Tennessee have manipulated district lines for federal, state, and local offices to deny voters of color equal opportunity to participate in the political process and elect the candidates of their choice. Make no mistake, at this moment, our nation's democracy stands on the precipice. We can talk all we want about the founding fathers, but they're, 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 they're turning over. We find ourselves in this position not only because of a procedural anachronism in the Senate, but because one of the two major political parties has chosen to reverse its historic support for strong voter rights protection. It's instead chosen voter suppression as a political strategy. As recently as 2006, Congress was able to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act by an overwhelmingly bipartisan vote, 98 to nothing in the Senate. 16 of those senators are still in the Senate and they didn't vote for the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act this time, and 390 to 33 in the House, over 10 to 1. President George W. Bush pushed for the law's passage, and he signed it into law. Now it appears that many on the other side of the aisle have come to the cynical conclusion that it no longer pays politically to protect voting rights. They want power at all costs. Process doesn't matter except how it helps them get power. Indeed, they seem to have come to the conclusion, erroneously in my view, that they can only win if they suppress the right to vote of certain Americans. This is a tragedy. It's a tragedy for our country that some of its leaders have embraced the idea in the year 2022 that true multiracial and multi-ethnic democracy is a threat to them. It is indeed, as Dr. King put it two generations ago, tragic betrayal of the highest mandate of our democratic tradition.
We now face an ever narrowing window to save our democracy. We saw that door shut pretty close in the Senate. We're two votes short of getting an extraordinary process to allow it to continue and 52 shorts of the unanimity that it saw in 2006. Let us hope that there's a crack in the door. The light shines in through a crack. Now I'd like to recognize uh, for an opening statement, the ranking member and the ranking member today is a gentleman from Texas, Mr. Roy. And I recognize Mr. Roy for his opening statement. <clears throat> well, I thank the gentleman uh, and I am indeed uh, substituting for my good friend, uh, Mike Johnson, who has a conflicting hearing. He's, he's uh, apologetic. apologetic, he can't be here. Uh, he's got a Hask conflict, um, but he'll be joining a little bit later. Um, it, you know, look, it, it, we're all um, uh, here with our own concerns about uh, what we saw happen last night. Um, and after last night's failure in the Senate, here we are again. This will be the seventh hearing that the subcommittee has had in nine months on the Democrats' race-baiting election bills. And that's what these are. Uh, today's hearing will use state redistricting efforts to continue to advance the false charge of voter suppression and threat to democracy. That's what we're going to hear today. There'll be cries that partisan gerrymandering that are conducted by both parties, that are conducted always by both parties, that are racial gerrymandering when they're conducted by the GOP. And these cries are all about crass political power because that's what gerrymandering has always been since its formation. We can talk about how to make districts more compact, how to make districts better represent the people, but this is all about crass political power and using race for that purpose. But that's not really what bothers me because that's what I'm used to. Um, it's that this the cynical use of, of racial fear mongering built on lies about bills being passed at the state level. After last night's failure in the Senate, another attempt, another failed attempt to defend massive legislation that Democrats have unilaterally jammed through the House multiple times now, specifically designed to thwart fully legitimate state reforms that are good faith attempts to ensure ballot and election integrity. Yet they will lie and claim that these good faith attempts are designed to suppress voting. That's not at all what these are about. For example, Speaker Pelosi said about Republicans that they, quote, voted to aid and abet the most dangerous campaign of voter suppression since Jim Crow. This is outrageous. It, it was it doubled down by the president last night, which I'll get to in a minute. This is a purposeful misinformation campaign by my Democrat colleagues and by the Democrat in the administration to lie and suggest that opposing the following is voter suppression, requiring voter identification. Ballot harvesting, a practice that risks third parties having undue influence or control on a person's voter ballot, limiting mail-in ballots to requested ballots and requiring IDs to use them, not having perhaps all-night ballot drop options. That was the charge in Houston in a hearing I was in down in the Texas legislature. Having fewer early voting days compared to, say, another state. That's what's at the basis of all these charges, that these things are somehow voter suppression. The misinformation campaign is designed to make Americans believe they are for protecting voting rights. They use that term on, on purpose, voting rights, because who could possibly be against voting rights? For example, allow me to quote from acclaimed election history and law experts, Jerry West, Nick Saban, Paul Tagliabue and company. Quote, in the last year, some 20 states have enacted dozens of laws that restrict voting access and allow local officials or state legislatures to interfere inappropriately with federal election outcomes. Motivated by the unanticipated outcomes of recent close elections conducted with integrity, they say, these state laws seek to secure partisan advantage by eliminating reliable practices with proven safeguards and substituting practices ripe for manipulation. No doubt these famed election law experts spent the weekend reading the federal legislation for which they were lobbying. Because, I mean, I got the 700-page bill at 1130 last Thursday night before voting on it on Friday, right before we got the rule. I assume they read it thoroughly over the weekend, as my staff stayed up in the middle of the night doing to actually see what was in the bill. I assume, too, that they know, for example, that the bill would lead to completely outlawing or eliminating voter identification. Do they know that four in five Americans, 80% support requiring voters to show photo identification in order to cast a ballot? 
I know my colleagues are sure fine with everybody having to show a voter identification with vax cards all across this country, including the nation's capital. Do they know that Delaware and Connecticut require photo or non-photo ID? And more, I'm certain that they have studied the intricacies of Texas, intricacies of Texas law before disparaging it. I'm sure they spent time looking at that. Or say studied the Georgia election law at least a little better than studying the University of Georgia's say defense. Do they know that Georgia has 17 days of early voting? And that President Biden's home state of Delaware only has 10 days? Are we looking at Delaware? This puts Delaware on par with Texas, which notably still has more than Maryland, eight days, Jersey, nine days, New York, nine days, and Connecticut, zero days. Zero days in that bastion of, of wing nuttery Connecticut. Georgia has no excuse absentee voting. Joe Biden's home state of Delaware requires an excuse for absentee voting. Now, look, I'm fine with Delaware having that option. It's actually a reasonable debate. But does that make Delaware the target of this committee's wrath? Do you, you don't hear them complaining about Delaware. You don't see the Biden administration bringing Delaware to court. You don't see the Biden Garland Department of Justice suing Maryland for their district maps in which Maryland Governor Larry Hogan called it the nation's most gerrymandered map after the state's legislature decided to override his veto. Why are they doing this? Because they have to claim voting rights are being violated to try to save themselves politically. Because they know their radical leftist agenda in which crime is skyrocketing, opioids are flooding into our country, cartels are in power, China's on the advance, vaccine mandates are crickling jobs, kids, and businesses, Russia is potentially invading Ukraine. All of that is being rejected by the American people. The truth is it is easier today for Americans to vote than ever before in our nation's history. Yet Democrats try to destroy the Senate filibuster on a partisan basis to do the following. Totally prohibit the use of voter identification, require states to allow felons to vote, create permanent paper ballot requirements, make political doxing targets of donors to private organizations, use taxpayer dollars for political campaigns, and I could go on and on. My Democratic colleagues are not interested in debating any of their failed policies, destroying freedom and the lives and livelihoods of Americans, but rather to sow fear. President Biden said just yesterday, and I quote, I'm not saying it's going to be legit. The increase in the prospect of being illegitimate is in direct proportion to us not being able to get those reforms passed. Further, quote, it all depends on whether or not we are able to make the case to the American people that this is being set up to try to alter the outcome of the election. Senator Schumer knew he wouldn't pass this bill. This purpose is not the legislation. The purpose is to delegitimize elections ahead of the game and to intentionally divide the country. They spent four years on Russian collusion. Now they're setting up the narrative for 2022 to use race baiting to create a toxic environment of distrust to delegitimize a possible GOP majority. And we should be better than that. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Roy. I'm sorry I didn't catch all of your your, your, your remarks because I was riveted to the picture over your, your head. Is, is that Ben Hogan? It is Ben Hogan. Uh, I, uh, my dad you know, grew up in Texas and, and I, I, I played college golf and Hogan sponsored us. So yeah, that's who that is. Well, I saw him when I was 10 years old here in Memphis. It was a great moment. He was a great golfer. Uh, yeah, um, great, great story. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Roy. Uh, now my pleasure to recognize the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler, who might have a picture of Y. E. Tittle somewhere. Unfortunately, I don't, but uh, thank you, Mr. <laughs> chairman, for convening this hearing. Today's hearing on voter suppression and continuing threats to democracy comes at a critical point in our history. For the past several weeks, the debate surrounding voting rights has been almost exclusively focused on Senate procedures. Yet it is critical to remember that while the Senate negotiates changes to its procedures, states like Georgia, Texas, North Carolina, and Ohio continue their assault on democracy. Legislation to protect the fundamental right to vote in fair elections, free from racial discrimination, faces united obstruction from Republicans in the Senate. Ironically, they are so intent on blocking legislation to strengthen our democracy that they will not even permit the vote, the most basic democratic act, the majority vote. This disregard for core small d democratic values no longer surprises many of us. But until relatively recently, both parties shared a commitment to supporting the Voting Rights Act. As President Biden pointed out in his recent speech in Atlanta, 
The Senate voted 98 to nothing to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act in 2006. Uh, and then uh, chair of the subcommittee, Steve Shabbat, and I presided over thousands of hundreds of, of hours of hearings to make the record. 16 Republican senators who voted to reauthorize the, the act that year still serve in the Senate, but now they stand firmly in opposition. Here in the House, Mr. Shabbat and I joined our former chairman, Jim Sensenbrenner and ranking member, John Conyers, to lead efforts to pass this 2006 reauthorization overwhelmingly by a vote of 390 to 33. President George W. Bush signed it into law. Sadly, that seems like ancient history now. As the threat to voting rights evolved for decades after the act's initial adoption, Congress continually updated and reauthorized the law on a strong bipartisan basis in response to less racially overt, but no less discriminatory threats to the right to vote. For example, section two of the act, which will be a primary focus of today's hearing, was amended on a bipartisan basis in 1982 to address attempts by state to dilute the strength of minority voting power through the redistricting process and the other changes to the methods of election on the federal, state, and local level. <clears throat> As we will hear from our witnesses today, vote dilution efforts remain a critical threat to our democracy, as certain states seek to co-opt the redistricting process. These states' attempts to dilute the strength of votes cast by minority voters are even more alarming in light of efforts by Republican state and local officials to manipulate the composition of local uh, election boards or otherwise change laws related to the administration of elections. And I must comment here on remarks made by Mr. Roy, who said that many states have, uh, um, have, have harmless laws. How in Georgia, for instance, and in other states, uh, precincts and drop boxes uh, are deliberately being reduced in uh, uh, minority areas so as to produce long lines, and then they make it a criminal offense to offer a, a sandwich or a, a drink of water to someone waiting on line. Um, gerrymandering is justified as political rather than racial gerrymandering. And yet we see, as Chairman Cohen noted, the racial motivation and the racial impact of these gerrymandering. The potential cumulative result of these various changes to voting procedures and district lines, if they remain in place, is a serious reduction in minority voting strength and reduction in black, Latino, and other minorities representation and participation in government at every level. An elected government that does not accurately reflect the participation of American voters, all American voters, regardless of race, is no true democracy. In response to these efforts, Congress must do once again what it has done repeatedly on a bipartisan basis for decades since 1965, update and strengthen the Voting Rights Act to ensure that all Americans can continue to vote and participate in our democracy. Yet this time, we have been met with total obstruction. The problem is not one senator from West Virginia. The problem is the political party, the Republican Party, that has given into cynicism and adopted the worst arguments of those who opposed the passage of the act in 1965, all to gain some marginal political advantage. Michael Carvin, representing the Arizona Republican Party in the Supreme Court, gave away the game when he boldly admitted this position in open court. In response to a question from Justice Amy Coney Barrett about why his party had an interest in defending strict voting restrictions that were alleged to violate Section 2, he commented that eliminating them, quote, puts us at a competitive disadvantage relative to Democrats. Politics is a zero-sum game, and every extra vote they get through an arguably unlawful interpretation of Section 2 hurts us, unquote. He wants to weaken voting rights because it will help him win. It's that simple. If we are to remain a true democracy, we must resist attempts to poison our election machinery with partisan interests that disenfranchise minority voters. And we must stop attempts by states to deny or dilute the votes of Americans because of their ethnicity or skin color. Our constitution and our values command no less. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I will remind everybody that we're taking votes now. So if you're not in, uh, in DC, 
at the Capitol, you might want to make sure you've cast your proxy vote. Now, my well, I'm not, it's not my pleasure. Uh, Mr. George's not going to give an opening statement. So we'll go to our witnesses now. Uh, we welcome our witnesses to on both panels and thank them for participating in today's hearing. I will now introduce each of our witnesses, and after each introduction, we'll recognize that witness for his or her oral testimony. Each of your written statements will be entered into the record. Uh, in its entirety, and I ask you to summarize your testimony in five minutes. To help you stay within that five minutes, there's a timer in the Zoom view that should be visible on your screen. Uh, not visible on my screen, but hopefully it's visible on your screen. Before proceeding, and maybe it could be visible on my screen. How do we do this? I don't know. Um, more background filters. Uh, too complex for me. Before proceeding with testimony, I would like to remind all of our witnesses you have a legal obligation to provide truthful testimony and answers to this subcommittee. Any false statement may subject you to prosecution under Section 1001, Title 18 of the United States Code. Our first witness is uh, Mr. Wade Henderson. Mr. Henderson has been with this committee as a witness and as a gentleman fighting for civil rights through my entire career in the Congress and for many years before that. He's a champion. He's the interim president and CEO of the Leadership Conference for Civil and Human Rights, having previously led that organization for more than 20 years. The Leadership Conference is a coalition of more than 200 civil and human rights organizations. He's a graduate of Howard University and the Rutgers University School of Law. Mr. Henderson, you are recognized for five minutes, sir. Good morning, Chairman Cohen, Ranking Member Roy, full committee Chairman Nadler, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the most pressing issue of our time, the freedom to vote. This morning, we find ourselves in an extraordinary moment. Last night, the Senate delivered a devastating one-two punch to our democracy. First, the cloture motion to end debate, which required a 60 vote majority, failed to bring to a final vote the freedom to vote John R. Lewis Act. Then an attempt at filibuster reform to ensure the eventual passage of the bill was defeated. Now, every Senator had a choice to make, whether to save our democracy or surrender it. In a deeply disappointing outcome, the Senate voted to surrender. Members surrendered our democracy to state and local legislators across the country who would take us back to a world which we call Jim Crow 2.0, a world of exclusion, control, and inequality. Members surrendered to those who stoked their partisan base with vicious rage and incited violence against this very body. And they surrendered it to those who wrongly challenged election outcomes and threatened election officials and their families. If ever there were a moment in history that we needed our leaders to unite to preserve our most fundamental principle of participatory democracy, this was it. And by leaders, I mean all senators from both parties. We not only called upon Democratic senators to defend our democracy, we called upon Republicans too. The Voting Rights Act has enjoyed strong bipartisan support since its enactment in 1965. This includes overwhelming votes in Congress for the reauthorizations that were signed into law by Republican presidents four times. 16 current Republican senators voted for the Voting Rights Act in 2006. Yesterday, we made a final plea to Minority Leader McConnell to allow an up or down vote, citing longstanding Republican support and reminding him that it was Republicans, not Democrats, who passed the 14th and 15th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. But last night, these senators failed to meet the moment. Their refusal to allow the John Lewis bill even to come to a vote shows how far their party has fallen. Yesterday was a devastating day for our democracy, but as Dr. King said, and I quote, change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through continuous struggle, unquote. I want to assure you that the struggle continues. The civil rights community is not backing down from this fight. Our elections, the officials who operate them, 
and the voters seeking to participate in them are all under relentless attack. We are in this fight for them, and we will fight until we win. Now, nearly nine years ago, the U.S. Supreme Court gutted the heart of the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County versus Holder. In its ruling, the court invited Congress to update the formula for requiring certain states and jurisdictions to pre-clear voting changes to ensure they do not discriminate. It was members of the House Judiciary Committee who took up the court's invitation to resolve with resolve and tenacity. I wanna thank the committee for your leadership in developing the congressional record with evidence of voter discrimination and taking seriously your obligation to restore the Voting Rights Act. The Leadership Conference supported uh, those efforts by publishing 13 state reports that documented the pervasive, persistent, and adaptive nature of modern day voting discrimination, just as the Supreme Court instructed. We documented how the floodgates of discrimination opened on the very day of the Shelby County decision. Mere hours after the announcement, North Carolina passed its monster anti-voter law, which was later struck down by the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals for targeting African-Americans with almost surgical precision. Texas was not far behind with its own restrictive bill that a federal court ruled was intentionally discriminatory. We documented how this assault on democracy has only grown in momentum since the 2020 election. The big lie fabricated by Donald Trump is fueling the actions of state lawmakers who are using the absence of federal voting protections to pass one restrictive voting law after another. A classic example is Arizona, which last year drastically limited voting by mail, the voting method of choice for 80% of Arizonans, combined with record-breaking changes or closures of polling places, Arizonans now have fewer opportunities to vote. We're also seeing frightening attacks on election officials and poll workers, interference with impartial election administration and challenges to election results and voter dilution through partisan gerrymandering. This coordinated anti- Mr. Henderson, we need to wrap up. Thank you, sir, I will. And we lost the battle last night, but as our heroes did before us, we will fight on until victory is won because we have no other choice. Our democracy demands it, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. I can't help but continue to think about Ben Hogan at a time when Charlie Sifford wasn't even allowed to play on the tour. And of course, Charlie Sifford was uh, relegated to uh, back backseat uh, tournaments until he won the Hartford Open in what was referred to as the Wing Nuttery State of Connecticut in 1967 great man, Charlie Sifford. I'd like to recognize our ne next witness, Ms. Sherilyn Eiffel. Ms. Eiffel is the president and director, Count director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, a position she's held since 2013. In that role, she's led the LDF and increased its visibility and engagement, litigating cutting edge and urgent civil rights issues and elevating the organization's decades long leadership fighting voter suppression, inequity in education, and racial discrimination in the criminal justice system. She first joined the Legal Defense Fund in 88, 1988 and litigated voting rights cases for five years before leaving to teach constitutional law and civil procedure for the next 20 years at the University of Maryland School of Law. She received her JD from New York University School of Law and an undergraduate degree from Vassar. Ms. Eiffel, you're recognized for five minutes and thank you. Good morning, Chairman Cohen. Vice Chairman Ross, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Cheryl and Eiffel, and I'm the President and Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, or LDF. I have had the honor of appearing before this committee in the past uh, to talk about the need for voting legislation to protect the rights of all Americans, especially for racial minorities. But I have never felt the sense of urgency or alarm that I, fe I feel appearing before you today. Last night, the U.S. Senate failed to find the will to push past an arcane rule with racist roots. This increases my alarm, but also my resolve. This country is in a state of democratic crisis. At this very moment, states are drafting, passing, and implementing laws designed 
to create insurmountable barriers to voting. Those barriers target principally, are targeted principally at Black and Latino voters, Native American voters, disabled voters, and students. They include laws designed to restrict early voting, absentee voting, and the use of ballot drop boxes. They add the insult of making it a crime to provide water or refreshments to the injury of those who have to wait up to nine hours to exercise the right that the Supreme Court has said is preservative of all rights, the right to vote. Laws have passed or are being considered that would leave Black and Latino voters vulnerable to the kind of intimidation reminiscent of the worst days of the civil rights struggle and that we saw on the rise in the 2020 election. Just this week, the governor of Florida announced a plan to create an election police force answerable to him. Even more alarmingly, states have passed laws that give partisan legislators control over the outcome of elections, no matter the votes cast. Election officials from secretaries of state to vote counters have experienced a sharp rise in threats to their lives and to their families. Scores of expert nonpartisan election officials have resigned from office rather than continue exposing their families to danger. This will be catastrophic elections. Since last spring, LDF has sued Florida, Georgia, and Texas to reverse uh, voting voter suppression laws targeted our, at our communities. These lawsuits have survived multiple attempts to prevent our clients from seeing their day in court, showing the seriousness of our claims. And we are suing Alabama and South Carolina for drawing congressional districts or state legislative maps that undercut black voters chance to elect candidates who will speak to their urgent concerns in the halls of power. Alabama's congressional map is akin to one person half a vote for that state's long suffering black community. But we cannot litigate our way past this threat. Others like Black Voters Matter, the NAACP, the League of Women Voters are organizing, mobilizing and registering voters on the ground but we cannot organize our way past this threat. In the past, it was Congress through the Voting Rights Act that ensured we had strong tools. Then the Supreme Court weakened those tools, first in the Shelby County versus Holder case, and then just this past summer in the Brnovich case. And this is why Congress must act. Do not be fooled by those who call voting legislation a federal takeover of state elections. That's what Southern segregation has said about mandatory school desegregation as part of massive resistance. Tell them that their problem is not with the Congress or with the Democrats, but with the Constitution itself. Tell them that Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution gives Congress the power to make laws that control the time, place, and manner of federal elections. Tell them that Section 5 of the 14th Amendment and Section 2 of the 15th Amendment expressly empower Congress to enforce the guarantees of equality in voting. You have the authority and the responsibility. And that constitutional power must outweigh allegiance to any congressional rule, particularly a rule that has been most often used to thwart civil rights. There's no more time to wait. Early voting for the Texas primary starts in just 25 days and black and brown voters will be heading to the polls with a shredded shield facing new restrictive laws without desperately needed federal protections. Added to this, we're more than halfway through the first redistricting process in six decades without the full protections of the Voting Rights Act. States like Texas and Alabama have seen population growth driven almost entirely by people of color, but have already drawn maps that fail to increase representation for those people or even set it back. And not just at the congressional level, but judicial districting, school board districting, and county commissions. One expert's blunt assessment of this redistricting cycle, people of color are getting shellacked. Black and brown Americans face the greatest assault on our voting rights in decades. And only Congress can help now, by passing the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act. As civil rights groups, we will not stop pushing for passage of the legislation. Historians seeking to explain the next century of American life will look back at this very moment and ask the question, did we act when we had the chance or did we squander our last best hope to protect the freedom to vote and save our democracy? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Ms. Eichel, and thank you for your important work. Our next witness is, is Damon Hewitt. He is the president and executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under law. He has over 20 years of civil rights litigation and policy experience, developed over numerous positions that he has held in various organizations in the nonprofit, philanthropic, and public sectors. He spent more than a decade as counsel in the NAACP Legal Defense Education Fund, 
as an author of numerous law review articles and book, The School to Prison Pipeline, Structuring Legal Reform. Mr. Hewitt received his JD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School and his BA from Louisiana State University. Mr. Hewitt, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Cohen, Vice Chair Ross, Ranking Member uh, Johnson, Mr. Roy, and members of this subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties. My name is Damon Hewitt, and I am President and Executive Director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. I appreciate the chance to testify before you today about the serious and ongoing threat that voter suppression and election subversion pose to Black voters, Brown voters, and ultimately our entire democracy. I join my fellow panelists in sounding the alarm to this committee, the full Congress and the public, about the urgent and substantial dangers we face as a nation due to the failure to adequately protect the fundamental right to vote for millions of people, particularly people of color, indigenous people, low-income people, senior citizens, students, and people with disabilities. In reaction to the historic voter participation in 2020 and fueled by the big lie, voter suppression bills have spread like a cancer throughout the states over the past year. And both brazen and violent efforts to subvert and overturn valid elections have gripped the nation. At the Lawyers Committee, we've seen these efforts up close. We've litigated more voter rights cases in the past decade than even the US Department of Justice, including pending cases in states like Georgia and Texas on voter suppression and redistricting cases in those states and also Illinois, where we actually sued Mr. Roy and challenged Democrats for their erosion of the voting strength of a black community in East St. Louis. We also hear directly from voters through our convening role in the Election Protection Coalition, the nation's largest and longest running, running nonpartisan voter protection effort. During the 2020 election season, we mobilized tens of thousands of volunteer attorneys and directly assisted over a quarter million voters through the 866 Our Vote Voter Protection Hotline as they cast their ballots through the global pandemic. We also represent U.S. Capitol Police officers in the civil rights lawsuit against the perpetrators and co-conspirators responsible for the violent January 6th Capitol insurrection. The voter suppression efforts and the violence we saw on January 6th actually share a common thread. These are deliberate acts by desperate people, those hell-bent on silencing millions of Black voters, Brown voters, young people, seniors, and others who turned out during the 2020 election, all in the interest of maintaining personal and partisan power. As you know, the Supreme Court has gutted the Voting Rights Act preclearance provision, the formula, uh, Section 4, which enables Section 5 and Shelby v. Holder. In the absence of preclearance, many states, including those with the record, a recent record, of discriminating against Black voters have enacted harsh voter suppression laws and devised new mechanisms to hijack electoral processes, measures that now go immediately into effect. In the past year alone, we were seeing bills that shortened the request period for mail-in ballots, impose strict signature requirements for vote by mail, adopt restrictions on how and when ballots can be delivered in terms of drop boxes and the like, and also closing polling place locations, in some cases reducing them down to one uh, in the county and limiting voting hours and shortening the early voting period. Georgia is a prime example, it's, it's SB202, which I believe Helen Butler will testify about uh, later uh, in this proceeding. But it's important to note that Georgia also enacted legislation that reconstituted several county election boards, including those in places like Morgan, Troop, Lincoln, and Spalding counties, purging black members from those election boards. So these bills are not just death by a thousand cuts. Those cuts are interspersed with deep and vicious gouges and gashes that we believe and allege are anti-democratic. The amounts of voter suppression because they target the means of voting that are most popular with communities of color even those that have become more, become more recently popular during the pandemic. They are specifically designed to make it harder for certain people to vote, which is why we have alleged intentional racial discrimination and not litigation. Remember, states like Georgia don't just want to change the rules to prevent people from voting, they also want to prevent any sunlight or accountability for their actions, hence the takeover of local election boards. In the absence of the prophylactic power of Section 5 to stop this kind of legislation through preclearance, impacted voters are left, left with less effective remedies. During last night's Senate floor debate, we heard one senator point to litigation under Section 2 in Texas and elsewhere as an indication that the Voting Rights Act still has some power. We believe it does have power, but let's be clear. Section 2 is not an effective substitute for Section 5. Section 2 litigation is more data-intensive, time-consuming, and expensive, but also it takes you know, time for the courts to actually render a ruling. By the time courts 
provide relief, sometimes the damage is already done, as I've indicated in my written testimony. Without Section 5 preclearance or robust Section 2 standard, which itself was also weakened and made cloudier by the Supreme Court's decision in Brnovich versus DNC, we are in a pickle as a nation, we're in a crisis as a community, and we must address this together. Congress must pass the combined Freedom to Vote and John R. Lewis Act to strengthen the Voting Rights Act's provisions. Members, this hearing comes just five days after what would have been the 93rd birthday of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I wanna leave you with his words. Voting is the foundation stone for political action. With it, we can eventually vote out of office public officials who bar the doorway to decent housing, public safety, jobs, and decent integrated education. The vote is essential. I believe that is exactly what some people are afraid of, that the vote is powerful, that the vote will be used by black voters, brown voters, and other voters of color, and other voters marginalized by voter suppression. And make no mistake, congressional action or obstruction or inaction in the face of these outrageous attacks on democracy is the moral equivalent of complicity in the acts themselves. Thank you for your time. I'll rely on my written remarks and testimony for the remainder uh, of, of my time. Thank you, Mr. Hewitt, and I apologize. I understand I incorrectly referred to the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund as Education Fund. So I want to get that clear, and thank you for your good work. Thank you. Our next witness is Mr. Thomas Science. Mr. Science has been with us before, Distinguished President, General Counsel of the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, or MALDEF, a position he has held since August 2009. He was also uh, with MALDEF for 12 years, and for eight years he taught civil rights litigation as an adjunct lecturer at the University of Southern California School of Law. Mr. Science uh, has received his JD with honors from Yale Law School with undergraduate degree, Max Summa, uh, summa Cum Laude from Comp Law from Yale. He's recognized now for five minutes. Thank you, good morning, uh, honorable chair, ranking member, and members of the subcommittee. I am Thomas Sines, President and General Counsel of MALDEF. And as you noted, I have had the opportunity in the last year or two to address this subcommittee about the critical importance of the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, and in particular, of reintroducing preclearance as a powerful form of alternative dispute resolution to both prevent and efficiently deter voting rights violations by jurisdictions across the country. Today, I have the opportunity to address the ongoing redistricting process that, as you all know, occurs every decade throughout the country. We are midway through that process, but we already have some sense of what the impact of this first redistricting without the protections of preclearance will be. For the Latino community that has shown substantial growth over the past several decades, every redistricting process since at least 1981 has presented the opportunity warranted by the growth of the Latino population to elect new officials who are responsive and selected by the Latino community. This year should have proved no exception. Our census showed that 51% of the entire country's population growth in the last decade was from the Latino community. Latinos are now 19% of the total national population and have shown even higher rates of growth in particular states around the country. But that opportunity that should have been occasioned through the census demonstrated growth has not been realized. Although we are midway through the process in some states and many localities are still going through the redistricting process, I can now quantify in some sense the impacts of the failure to put in place the John R. Lewis Act, and in particular, its preclearance formulas. MALDEF is in litigation against three states, Texas, Illinois, and as of yesterday, Washington, about their statewide redistricting processes. I choose these three states, not just because we're litigating against them, but because they demonstrate the lie about the assertion that somehow the Voting Rights Act is a partisan tool used only against Republicans. In Illinois, the process we challenged was entirely in the hands of Democrats. In Texas, yes, it was entirely in the hands of Republicans. 
in Washington state, notably, it was a redistricting commission rather than a partisan legislature that drew the lines that we now challenge. In these three states, but in particular in Illinois and Texas both, we saw not just the failure to create new Latino majority districts in state legislature, Congress, and in the Texas State Board of Education, but also the dismantling of districts that were already Latino majority, either because they were drawn that way a decade earlier, or because they had developed through natural movement of population into being majority Latino districts over the last decade. So we saw both failure to create new districts and dismantling of existing Latino majority districts. In these three states, we saw for the Latino community, the price of the failure to enact the John Lewis Act in 18 lost Latino majority seats in Congress, state legislatures, and state board of education, 18 seats. I emphasize that because the unfortunate nature of vote suppression is we often cannot quantify the impact. Even at the primary level, we can only estimate how many eligible voters have been prevented from registering or casting a ballot. We can only speculate about how they might have voted and the impact on the elections. When it comes to secondary effects, we can only guess. We know it's devastating. We can only guess at how many voters were deterred from participating themselves because a member of their family or community was presented, prevented by vote suppression from casting a ballot. And at the tertiary level, again, devastating we know, but we can only guess at how many people have seen their cynicism about government increase because of vote suppression. But through redistricting, we can quantify the effects of the failure to enact the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. The Latino community now stands at 18 lost Latino majority districts, districts that would have allowed the growing Latino community present in this country from its very beginnings in significant numbers since the mid 19th century and an increasing proportion of our future would have allowed that community to elect candidates of choice to important legislative positions. That 18 is only the beginning because we are only midway through this process. That 18, however, demonstrates how critically important that the Senate- I believe time is about to expire. That the Senate act to put in place the John Lewis Act and the preclearance formulas that are embedded within it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our, our next uh, witness is Ms. Maureen Reardon. Uh, welcome you back. You've been with us before. It's nice to have you back again. Uh, litigation counsel for the Public Interest Legal Foundation, which she joined in 2021 after previously serving for 20 years as an attorney in the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, including a senior counsel to the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights during the Trump administration. Uh, Ms. Reardon received her JD from St. Mary's University School of Law and her BS in Criminal Justice from Seton Hall. Ms. Reardon, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee and ranking members. Thank you for your invitation to testify today. For over 20 years, I served in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice. 18 of those years were spent as a voting section attorney and senior counsel. From August of 2000 until the Supreme Court's decision in Shelby County versus Holder, my sole responsibility was to review changes in voting that were submitted for Section 5 preclearance. In that decision by the Supreme Court, the court made clear that only certain conditions would justify any formula for Section 5 coverage today. And among the touchstones listed by the court are blatant discriminatory evasions of federal decrees, a lack of minority office holding, tests and devices to vote, and voting discrimination that is both flagrant and rampant. Simply put, such discrimination does not, in my opinion, exist today. As the Supreme Court stated, federal intrusion into the powers that are reserved to the states must relate to empirical evidence and triggers such as many of those contained in these bills that are built around political and partisan goals will never withstand constitutional scrutiny. 
I come from a unique perspective because I did spend 20 years enforcing the Voting Rights Act. And unfortunately, I have learned some discouraging truths. The section to which the John R. Lewis uh, Voting Rights Bill would give power to is the voting section in the DOJ. I have to tell you that that voting section is full of ideological partisan bureaucrats. Employees display an open hostility to anyone who does not hold their leftist beliefs. The Inspector General report that I've attached to my written testimony provides many instances of bad behavior. They have a disdain for the equal application of civil rights to all Americans. And furthermore, there is an accepted belief that certain states should be targeted by the department in their voting rights enforcement. I have actually witnessed signs on attorneys' doors that state, mess with Texas. And after the Shelby County uh, decision, extinguished the Section 5 enforcement abilities, the company line within the section was the following. If we could just get a case of intentional discrimination by the state of Texas, we can request Section 3C coverage, and that'll be enough work to keep everybody busy. The section has a long list of abuses by its lawyers for improper collaboration in reviewing Section 5 um, submissions. If you want to know how Georgia was targeted, one might look at the um, case of Johnson versus Miller. I've attached the opinion to my written testimony and I encourage everyone to read it. Here, the court sanctioned voting section attorneys in the amount of $594,000 for their egregious behavior in collusion with an attorney from the ACLU. The department had twice refused to pre-clear a redistricting plan by the state of Georgia for congressional offices. After twice refusing to pre-clear that plan, they demanded that Georgia submit a plan containing minority representation that was far in excess of what is legally required or permissible. On the third attempt to get pre-clearance, the state of Georgia caved and actually accepted and put forward a plan that had been um, submitted by an ACLU attorney and recommended by the department. Unfortunately for the state of Georgia, Years later, the federal court found that the plan violated the 14th Amendment and it was drawn for, because it was drawn for race reasons only. Essentially, the state of Georgia was denied preclearance of its plan until it was browbeaten by the Department of Justice to accept a plan that clearly violated the 14th Amendment. There are permanent provisions of the Voting Rights Act, such as Section 2, that prohibit discrimination and provide the, D the DOJ with the ability to challenge election procedures. It is noting that until this year, they've only brought four Section 2 violations since the Shelby, excuse me, the Shelby decision. Lastly, these bills um, ban state photo IDs, despite overwhelming support from a clear majority of Americans. They require same-day registration, require recognition of coalition districts, limit a state's ability to verify eligibility and remove ineligible voters, require online voter registration, and require automatic registration, require the restoration of felon voting rights and taxpayer money to fund congressional candidates. These are just a few of the provisions. These provisions accomplish three things. One, they overturn several Supreme Court precedents. Two, they severely damage the integrity of our elections. And finally, they impose unconstitutional mandates on the states. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reardon. Our next witness is Mr. T. Russell Noble. If I mispronounce that, help me. He's Senior Attorney for Judicial Watch. From 2005 to 2012, he served as trial attorney in the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, including five years in the division's voting section. He was also previously was a legislative assistant for a member of the House Financial Services Committee. Uh, he received his JD from the Mississippi College School of Law and his BA from the University of Mississippi. He served as law clerk to the Supreme Court of Mississippi. Uh, Mr. Noble or Mr. Noble, or please no, but, help that you recognize for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Cohen and Ranking Member Roy and other members of the subcommittee. It's an honor to be back before the subcommittee. In 2008, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of voter ID. Following that ruling, there was a rush by advocacy groups alleging rampant illegal voter suppression. The nature of those claims varied, but they usually 
involved allegations that common sense election regulations, such as voter ID and longstanding time, place, and manner regulations disenfranchise minority voters. Such allegations gain new intensity after the Supreme Court's 2013 Shelby County rule. Following that, many advocates revised their approach, claiming that alleged voter suppression could only be stopped if Congress would pass new legislation that abandons 233 years of constitutional tradition and have the federal government, rather than the states, assume control over elections nationwide. In an attempt to rally support for this new legislation, its proponents have described a near dystopian-like world in which minorities have no right to vote, and even going so far as to coin the term Jim Crow 2.0 to describe disfavored state election regulations. More recently, they've smeared people that don't support federal takeover elections as long lost supporters of Jefferson Davis, George Wallace, and Bull Connor. Everyone here knows what Jim Crow involved. It was state-sponsored oppression of American citizens, and in many instances, much worse. It is a uniquely dark period in our nation's history with few parallels. For that reason, it's mystifying that some allegedly serious advocates would smear reasonable common sense election regulations as Jim Crow 2.0. Such glib comments suggest the speaker neither understands Jim Crow nor election regulations. Jim Crow is not a brand, it's not a software update. It's a dark period in our history that is being invoked right now to inflame passions and to create fear in minority communities. As I testified before this committee in July of last year, minority registration and turnout, not hyperbolic sound bites, tell the true story of ballot access in the United States. Recent data shows that racial disparities in voting have been dramatically reduced, in many cases eliminated. This progress is something we should be proud of, yet proponents of federalizing elections rarely mention it. The fact is that the minority participation during the 2020 election was exponentially higher nationwide than it was during the actual Jim Crow period in 1965. For example, take Tennessee, Chairman Cohen's home state. Black registration and turnout in Tennessee in 2020 exceeded that for whites. That's hardly Jim Crow. The same is true just downriver in Mississippi. Previously, Jim Crow Mississippi had an astonishing low, astonishingly low 64% registration rate for Blacks. Ballot access has actually improved over the last 15 years despite relentless voter suppression claims. Minority registration and turnout has increased and racial disparities have decreased. The reality is that it's simply impossible for anyone to reconcile current claims of large scale voter suppression with ballot access statistics. Moreover, despite the near ceaseless claims of voter suppression over these, this time period, there is woefully inadequate popular support in, federal, in favor of a federal takeover of elections. Indeed, it's hard to imagine, it's hard to find alleged support for federalizing elections to be overseen by a federal agency akin to the CDC, the IRS, the Postal Service, or even the DOJ. The improvements in ballot access statistics over the last 15 years occurred even while numerous states impl implemented allegedly suppressive voter ID policies. In fact, concerns about allegedly suppressive voter ID policies have failed so spectacularly that voter ID now enjoys near universal national support with recent polling estimating 80% of Americans support it. There is an undeniable disconnect between today's voter suppression narrative and reality, which explains why there is inadequate popular support for federalizing elections. Until this is resolved, the John Lewis Act and the Freedom to Vote Act will remain remedies in search of a problem. Thank you very much for the invitation to testify today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, and I do remember you from our previous hearings. Would you remind me how you pronounce your name? Uh, yeah, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's No Bill. No Bill. Like Mobile, Alabama with an N. Mobile. 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 I got you. Thank you, Mr. Noble. Uh, and somebody's noticed that I moved my chair and I did that for a purpose. Uh, Mr. Henderson will understand why, I guess. I'm, I'm behind, oh, underneath Everett Dirksen, who looks a bit frazzled and upset, and that's the way he'd be today. Senator Dirksen, who led the cloture fight in 1964 to pass the Civil Rights Bill, first time a cloture uh, vote had ever succeeded on a Civil Rights Act, he was a Republican, and the Republican minority leader 
and he was a sponsor, the prime sponsor of the 1965 voting rights law uh, that passed, as did the Civil Rights Bill, with more Republican percentage votes than Democratic votes. The only no votes on those bills in the, uh, were the Southerners uh, who resisted change forever. But Everett Dirksen, a great senator uh, back in the day when uh, uh, Republicans were true to their original founding and had always been for civil rights. Uh, now I'd like to recognize Mr. Derek Johnson. He's the president and CEO of the NAACP, a position he has held since October of 2017. He previously served as vice chairman of the NAACP National Board of Directors and as president of the NAACP Mississippi State Conference. Mr. Johnson received his JD from South Texas College of Law, his undergraduate school uh, degree from Tugaloo College in Jackson, Mississippi, which I believe was uh, uh, also the, uh, uh, I think Benny Thompson might have gone there, but I know uh, Little Anderson did. Uh, man I know in Memphis who just passed away, a fine lawyer. Mr. Johnson, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Johnson, you might need to turn on your microphone. That's important, you can hear me now. That's exactly right. That's right. Thank you. All right. Good morning, uh, Chairman Nader and Cohen, ranking members. Jordan and Johnson and subcommittee members. Thank you for the invitation to testify about concerted effort to disenfranchise Black Americans and the need to pass the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act. I ask permission to include my full statement in the record. I, may, I am proud to be with you today, representing the nation's oldest and largest civil rights organization. I'm here to speak for members and activists of the NACP across the country. I'm also speaking to you as a proud adopted son of the state of Mississippi. Mississippi has been my home for the past 30 years. I live and work in the heart of the state where so many battles for civil rights were fought. It was in Mississippi where Mega Evers, my predecessor, served at the state conference and gave his life for the cause of voting rights. It was in Mississippi where righteous people of all races, religions, and creeds converged 58 years ago to register voters during Freedom Summer. Among them were individuals such as Hollis Watkins and Uvester Simpson, uh, who worked closely with Fannie Lou Hamer. It was in Mississippi where some of those heroes were summarily executed by white supremacists for the crime of registering Black voters. The sacrifice made this country a more perfect union. But the danger they struggled against never fully disappeared. Instead, it festered under the surface and is now spilling back out in a toxic soup of white supremacy. We're now facing an all out attack on black voters by a former president, state governors, federal and state legislators with complicity of the Supreme Court majority that has abandoned its duty to uphold the constitution to protect black voters' right black citizens' right to vote. We saw this right here in Mississippi where NACP documented an alarming degree of voter suppression in 2020. For example, polling places in black neighborhoods throughout the state endured an increase in very visible police presence. Black voters were purged from voting rolls and forced to vote provisionally without any certainty that their vote would eventually be counted. Late openings, equipment problems, long lines in predominantly black neighborhoods forced many voters to choose between their paycheck and their vote as a result of waiting an enormous amount of time to cast their ballot. But this wasn't limited to Mississippi. This was repeated in many states across the country, North and South. As serious as these problems were, we now know that 2020 was just a dress rehearsal for the upcoming elections. The new Jim Crow generation has ramped up its efforts to suppress the political power of Black Americans to a new level with tools and tactics their predecessors could only dream of. We're looking at new lyrics with the same old song. Even if we can find a way to overcome the obstacles they are constructing, they are creating a coordinated framework to assure that ballots once cast are not counted and will not count. The Freedom to Vote, John R. Lewis Act will go a long way towards disrupting this effort to disenfranchise Black voters. The NAACP has never backed down 
from working for equality and justice, and we will not back down now along with our partners. But we can't do it alone. We need Congress to join us, to hold true to your constitutional duty to protect our vote. Earlier this week, we marked Dr. King's birthday. And we watched numerous politicians quote Dr. King and embrace his life and legacy. I say to all of you that words are nice, but in the end, it is your actions that matter and that you will be remembered for. And the action we need from you now is to stand on the right side of history and pass the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act. It is so important to understand that what we witnessed last night isn't the end because the Voting Rights Act originally, it took three attempts to finally pass. Thank you for this opportunity to testify before you today, and I will be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Johnson, and thank you for your work in representing uh, NAACP and, and, and Tougaloo. Helen Butler is the Executive Director of the Georgia Coalition for the People's Agenda. In that role, she leads an advocacy organization founded by the Honorable uh, Reverend Dr. Joseph E. Lowry and leads initiatives that increase citizen participation in the government of their communities and areas that include education, criminal and juvenile justice reform, voter protection, and economic development. Ms. Butler, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cohen, uh, Vice Chair Ross, uh, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the committee. I'm Helen Butler, Executive Director of the Georgia Coalition for the People's Agenda, and I thank you for allowing me this opportunity uh, to talk about the ongoing threats to the voting rights of Georgia's Black voters and other voters of color, which deny them equal access to the ballot box and ultimately undermine democracy. Uh, the People's Agenda has always been dedicated to fighting for the voting rights of Georgia citizens through public education, training, advocacy, and litigation. However, we are spending even more time and limited resources fighting discriminatory voting laws, policies, and procedures at the state and local levels in Georgia uh, without the pre-clearance process of Section 5 that would have prevented many of these discriminatory voting laws and discriminatory redistricting plans from taking effect. According to the census, Georgia was one of the top five states gaining population in the past decade, with Black people accounting for 12.5%, the Latinx population 32%, and the AAPI population 32%. Uh, 52%. By contrast, Georgia's white population decreased by 4%. Uh, the electorate has undergone significant demographic changes with increases in the percentage of Black Georgians and other Georgians of color registering to vote, participating in elections, and uses, utilizing mail voting and early voting for casting their ballots uh, in all of their elections. These changes in voting patterns have resulted in corresponding political changes, as we saw with our historic election of our first Black U.S. Senator Raphael Warnock and first Jewish Senator John Ossoff. But in response to this increase in diversity of Georgia's electorate, our majority party enacted SB 202, an omnibus voter suppression bill which drastically altered the process by which voters apply for and receive absentee ballots for mail-in voting. It placed new restrictions and severe penalties on public officials and nonprofit groups like mine for providing absentee ballot applications to voters who need them. It outlined outlawed nonprofit organizations for providing just water and comfort items to voters who stood in line, long lines waiting to vote at polling locations and other suppressive restrictions and penalties. At the same time, SB 202 allowed voter challenges, including partisans seeking to suppress the vote by lodging uh, frivolous challenges, which required election officials uh, to schedule time-consuming hearings, even while administering elections. 
and only giving voters three days notice to respond. And that notice was by mail, which oftentimes meant that they would have to uh, leave their jobs or school commitments and not be able to attend to defend their right to vote. Just last night, the People's Agenda and other Georgia grassroots organizations were in Lincoln, uh, in Lincoln County, Georgia, a rural county with a large landmass, no public transportation, and approximately 6,000 registered voters for a board of elections meeting where the board was planning to vote on a proposal to close all uh, seven of the county's existing polling places and replace them with a single vote center in a gymnasium located on a two lane country road outside of the main downtown business and residential districts in the city of Lincoln. This proposal came on the heels of new restrictions to absentee voting in SB 202, as well as another bill signed uh, by Governor Kemp in 2021 that reconstituted the Lincoln County Board of Elections to ensure that the majority party would have control over the appointment of a majority of the members of boards of elections. In an effort to stop this uh, from this change from happening, the People's Agenda and our partners presented the Board of Elections with a petition under Georgia law, which would prevent, prohibit the county from moving forward with polling place changes if 20% of the voters in a precinct signed the petition. That petition we submitted met the threshold for three of the seven precincts. During Ms. the Board of Elections meeting, Ms. Of Butler, course, your the, time is up. Oh, sorry. Okay. What I'm saying to this is that we really need the full force and the passage of the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act to ensure the protection of the right to vote for all Americans uh, because we stand in imminent danger of having our hard fought rights denied in greater numbers. Please act now like our voting rights and democracy depend upon it because it does. Thank you, Ms. Butler. I appreciate your, your testimony. Uh, Mr. Garcia uh, was next on our agenda. Mr. D D Domingo Garcia, I don't believe, is he able to hear us? I think he's having technical difficulties. And so be it, uh, he he's, uh, was going to represent the United Latin American citizens, LULAC, but he's not able to participate because of technical difficulties. So thank you for your attempt and thank you for all the witnesses. And we'll now go under the five minute rule with questions and I will begin by recognizing myself. Uh, first, I just wanna put another historical footnote. Everett Dirksen, of course, behind me is a historical footnote and a great one for this day. But the 19th, the last Civil Voting Rights Act we had in 2006 was named for Fannie Lou Hamer, Mr. Johnson, for uh, Rosa Parks, for Barbara Jordan, and Cesar Chavez and other great civil rights leaders. Uh, a civil rights leader uh, in, in our committee is Ms. Lucy McBath of Georgia. And I think it's appropriate at this point after Ms. Butler's testimony that I yield the remainder of my time to Ms. McBath, who knows firsthand what Georgia's doing in redistricting. Ms. McBath, you're recognized for the remainder of my time. Well, thank you so much, Chairman Cohen and, and Congressman Raskin and all the members for allowing me just a moment to address the committee today. You know, in recent years and arguably even longer, my home state of Georgia, my district has kind of been the poster child uh, for state-led voter suppression. And the state has repeatedly sought to suppress the voices and the will of millions of Georgians, particularly African-Americans. And sadly, voter suppression is not just a Georgia issue, as we've said today, but it's rampant across the South and increasingly in many other states in our great nation. A voter suppression is just not a racial issue. It's an issue of democracy and efforts to support or, or efforts to suppress the will of the people are in turn attempts to suppress the promise of democracy that was intended for our nation. 
And when not all Americans are guaranteed the capacity to fully exercise their right to vote, and when votes are diluted, as we watch is happening all over America, we weaken our country's ability to live up to its full potential. This Congress has a responsibility to and must pass voting rights legislation. And as Martin Luther King Jr. has said in the past, and I repeat this so eloquently, he spoke this, we are in the fierce urgency of now. Thank you so much for allowing me a moment and I yield back the balance of my time. You're very welcome, Ms. McBath. Uh, Ms. Butler, uh, people have said that, I think Mr. Roy said that certain states like Delaware got less early voting than Georgia. Tell us some of the things that Georgia has done to oppress people's right to vote. Why, why is the voting rights law in the Supreme Court's eye on Georgia? Why would that be important for the people to vote? Well, as I said, they're making it more difficult for people to be able to exercise their right to vote by mail. Uh, they're requiring photo ID uh, that be submitted with their absentee ballot application. Let me ask you about that because that's interesting. I'm not, a lot of people are for uh, voter ID and, and all, but for, for absentee ballots, how do you do voter ID in Georgia? How do, what do they want you to do? Take a hologram and send it in? Well, you, if you don't have a Georgia driver's license or Georgia state, I, Georgia state ID, not even the free folk voter ID that you get from the state, but a state ID, uh, then you have to provide one of the other pieces of ID, like a copy of your utility bill or some other piece of document that proves your name and address. But of course, to do that, you'd have to have the capability of making copies. Well, as we were in Lincoln County yesterday, there is not a, a FedEx center there's not an office depot for people to actually go and make copies. So if you don't have a copy machine at home, then how do you get a copy to send in? Because you're still in a pandemic. They will be required to travel uh, 15 to 20 miles to get one way to get to a polling location. Uh, so it would be very difficult for them to do that. I got Internet you. I, connection, I, see, I see the problem. Internet connection, too, is a yeah. problem. Yeah, a lot of people in my district don't have uh, uh, copy machines in their homes. They hardly have uh, black and white televisions. It's, a, right. it's not easy. Uh, to tell, Mr. Henderson, uh, tell, you, you've been around a while. Tell me back in the day when you recall when Republicans were leaders of civil rights and voting rights like Everett Dirks. What's changed? Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Cohen, Chairman Cohen, for your question. And your portrait of Everett Dirksen behind you is a very powerful reminder of the important bipartisan support for voting rights since the inception of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. You mentioned in your opening statement the support of a bipartisan Senate and House of Representatives for the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act in 2006. It's important to remember that. I remember when a committee chairman of judiciary, F. James Sensenbrenner, went to the floor of the House of Representatives to defend the Voting Rights Act against four amendments, any one of which could have easily derailed the bill. It was a powerful indication of the importance of leadership and bipartisan support that made that bill possible. Unfortunately, our country today is very different than it was in 2006. It's incredibly polarized. And we are seeing that polarization reflected in the unwillingness of Republicans in the Senate to even support a motion to proceed to debate, to even allow the bill to be debated. When we and the leadership conference membership sought to get support from Republicans, our members wrote to 16 Republican senators requesting a meeting and particularizing activity taking place in each of their states to justify why it was so important for them to at least express a willingness to sit down and talk. We found complete resistance to that effort. So to suggest, as has been done in the Senate, that we did not reach out to Republicans is simply false. And we have documented that in a series of letters that we wrote. 
it is impossible to have bipartisanship if one side completely refuses to even discuss an issue of extraordinary importance. And that's Thank why you. this effort was so clear. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Henderson, for Thank explaining you. why it's complex and not cinemablistic to get these things done. Uh, I now recognize the uh, temporary ranking member, Mr. Roy, for questions. Is Mr. Roy with us? If not, is there a Republican with us? The Republicans have left the room like Elvis used to. So, Mr. Nadler, you're on. Mr. Nadler? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Eiffel, in your testimony, you cite historical parallels between the urgency of this moment and the end of the Reconstruction era. Could you further elaborate on this point and explain how the Voting Rights Act has until now served as a bulwark against the democratic backsliding we are witnessing in states like Georgia and Texas? Uh, Chairman Nadler, yes. Um, as a matter of fact, I think this is a really important point because one of the things it's critical to understand about the voter suppression laws that we're seeing um, is that the rise in these laws began immediately after the Supreme Court's decision in the Shelby County versus Holder case in 2013. Uh, within months, Texas had decided to resuscitate a, a voter ID law that they would not have been able to pre-clear, that they had in fact tried to pre-clear earlier and were prevented from doing so. We sued and challenged that law, and we were ultimately successful. The trial court, in fact, found that there was intentional discrimination in the uh, creation of that voter ID law. So the, the progress that Mr. Uh, Mobile talked about in Mississippi, for example, was directly the progress that came as a result of the Voting Rights Act, of the Voting Rights Act's preclearance provisions, of uh, Section 2, of the other provisions that protected against conspiracies to interfere with the right to vote. In the Reconstruction period, uh, the, the Reconstruction Congress was very clear about what would be needed to, to ensure that Black people would be full citizens. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments obviously are the amendments uh, that were designed to ensure that, the 13th ending slavery, the 14th, providing for birthright citizenship for both free and uh, formerly enslaved Black people. Their citizenship had been taken away by the Dred Scott decision, um, and including several provisions within the 14th Amendment that would punish Southern states that did not allow, at that time, Black men to vote. And then the 15th Amendment, protecting against racial discrimination in voting. In both the 14th and the 15th Amendment, the Reconstruction Congress included enforcement clauses. And those clauses gave Congress the power to enforce the guarantees that were articulated in the two amendments. That is the power from which Congress was able to pass the Voting Rights Act. It's a statute that, is, that implements the power that was given to the Congress in the Constitution in the, in the 14th and 15th Amendments. And it was that power that Congress did not use, uh, frankly, um, for the first half of the 20th century and the, and the uh, last 20, 30 years of the, of the uh, 19th century, uh, they failed to use that power, which is why Black voters were disenfranchised in this country, particularly in the South, for most of the 20th century until the civil rights movement pushed Congress, forced Congress to wake up, forced Congress to do its duty, forced Congress to fulfill its obligations under the 14th and 15th Amendments, by passing the Voting Rights Act, which provided uh, those provisions that resulted in the ability of many Black people to be able to vote. But what was Great. interesting, and I just add one thing about, about the Voting Rights Act, was that in the, in the act, in the, in the legislative history, what the Congress said is that the Voting Rights Act, particularly Section 5, was meant not only to address voting discrimination that they were seeing at the moment, but to address what they described as ingenious methods that might be used in the future. They didn't have laws then that kept you from providing water to people online to vote, but they knew that there would be ingenious methods in the future. That was the purpose of preclearance, and that's why we need it back. I have one question. Mr. Sands, what is the difference between racial and partisan gerrymandering? What are the challenges of proving race discrimination in gerrymandering under Section 2? Thank you, uh, Congress member. The fact is that Section 2 litigation is extremely difficult, and that is because it is litigated under the totality of the circumstances test established 
in the legislation. That means that you have to uh, put together an array of experts on issues relating to discrimination in voting and beyond. You have to put together lay witnesses who have experienced the kind of vote dilution or vote suppression that you're challenging. It is simply extremely difficult to prove. The same is true of racial gerrymandering, where you have to demonstrate that the predominant consideration by the redistricting body uh, was race, when we know that race is a relevant consideration, the Supreme Court has recognized that. So you are trying to put what is done into a very narrow scope of over-considering race. Bottom line, as you know, is that litigation under Section 2 and under the Constitution is extremely expensive and why we need preclearance as an ADR mechanism to more efficiently address voting rights violations. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. I'd now like to recognize a Republican. It's a Republican who is with us and wants to be recognized. If not, I would just like to remind people that Everett Dirksen sponsored the Voting Rights Act again and led the cloture vote. Uh, the first time ever a civil rights bill had been stopped by cloture because for years the filibuster was there to defeat civil rights laws. That's why it was founded. That's why it was started. Even Yale has taken John Calhoun's name out of its history, off its storm, and into the dustbin of history. I now recognize for questioning Mr. Raskin. Is Mr. Raskin with us? I think Ms., I'll go to Mr. Hank Johnson. I think he, I saw him on the screen. Is Mr. Johnson still with us? Mr. Johnson, he's walking, so he must have voted. So we'll go to Ms. Garcia of Texas, Ms. Sylvia Garcia from the great state. Well, I'm not gonna say that, from Texas. Well, th thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for once again, bringing this very critical matter to our attention. Um, you know, I am not one that's complaining about the seven hearings that we've had. I'm not the one complaining about putting more and more attention. It really is a time for action and a time for legislation. So thank you again. This is actually, you know, uh, it, it's something that's really dear to my heart because many of the items that we've been talking about are items that have stemmed from the state of Texas. As we all know, our democracy is built on the sacred principle that every American has an equal and fair right to vote. But states like my home state of Texas are imposing laws that are already limiting that sacred right. Texas and other states continue to pass laws that suppress, silence, and dilute minority voters, especially Latinos. We cannot let this stand. We must take action. It is our responsibility, our duty, to protect voting rights for every American, no matter what their zip code, where they live, or what language they speak. By banning partisan gerrymandering and creating new protections for voters, we will ensure every American makes their voice, can make their voice heard. History has shown us uh, that Texas and Texas Republicans have gone to much lengths in, in the past and continue to do that to suppress votes. I disagree from my colleague from Texas from the other side of the aisle. Suppression is alive and well in Texas, whether or not you want to admit it. For decades, Republicans have split up and packed communities of color to dilute their vote and suppress their vote. As was mentioned in the uh, uh, chairman's remarks earlier, in Texas, 95% of the growth in Texas was due to people of color, predominantly Latino. Yet, all of the districts that were created were created for Republican white voting districts. So I want to start with Ms., uh, Mr. Sines. Uh, Mr. Sines, you and I worked together on many of these issues for, for, for a long time. Tell us how changes in the Voting Rights Act would pre protect us uh, and prevent a legislature from doing what they did this last time, where even though the population growth was people of color, the results were that they packed um, uh, Democrats into districts and created more white Republican districts. Absolutely. As I mentioned in my testimony, we have seen in three different states a total of 18 lost Latino majority districts. Ten of those come out of Texas. And that's despite, as you know, half of the growth of the state being Latino in the last decade. Those 10 lost seats are in Congress, State House, State Senate, and on the State Board of Education. How a reinvigorated Voting Rights Act through the John Lewis Act would address that is clear. Texas would be required under the John Lewis Act 
under both the geographic preclearance formula and the known practices coverage formula would be required to submit its redistricting statewide for pre-review pre and preclearance, either by the Department of Justice, or as you know, as Texas has decided in, in several occasions in the past, or by a three judge district court in Washington, DC. That would efficiently determine whether there was retrogression as there clearly has been in the maps adopted this year or last year rather, uh, and whether there has been intentional voter discrimination as Texas uh, has been adjudicated over several redistricting rounds. So instead of being mired in litigation that because of the delay in census data and because of your early primary in Texas uh, will not be resolved before the 2022 primary elections move forward, we, instead we would have through preclearance very efficiently and effectively prevented these violative redistricting lines from ever taking effect. Uh, the result today because of the failure of the Senate to enact the John Lewis Act is that we will have in 2022 these violative lines in place in Texas. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I uh, and, um, I only have like 40 seconds. I will yield my 40 seconds to my colleague and friend, Lucy Macbeth, uh, when her time comes at the end of the hearing. Ms. Macbeth has already spoken. If she'd like some more time, she's, she's certainly- uh, Oh, well, I apologize. I was on the floor and I did not know that. I thought I thought she was gonna be left for the end of the hearing as she stated. So if she, she wants 40 seconds, she can have them. Well, let me ask Ms. McBath a question. You got for in, in redistricting in Georgia, what did they do with your district? Well, thank you so much for the time to explain. But uh, District Six is the district in Georgia that needed to change the least. And so, what they actually actually have done, they've taken a Biden plus eleven district, and they swung at twenty six points to Trump. It is now a Trump fifteen district. They've taken out of my existing district most of the diverse and uh, democratic voting blocks and, and have shuffled, shuffled in a very conservative, conservative and Trump and uh, red voting blocks. And that was, that was deliberate. I have always been the top target by the Republican party here in Georgia and um, being, you know, the member that sits in the seat that was once held by Newt Gingrich and I'm the first minority in the history of Georgia to ever sit in this seat. The first Democrat since 1979, I have always been the target. And so what they have done is, you know, taken two swing districts, District 6 and 7, and they've created a new Democratic open seat, District 7, but they have done what we know to be cracking and packing. Thank you, Ms. McBath, and I'm just shocked at that because Mr. Roy said that didn't happen, it doesn't exist. But uh, Ms. Garcia, your time is your time, and I guess you have to yield it because your five minutes are up, but thank you, Ms. Garcia. Uh, next, we're gonna to go to a Republican. Is a Republican with us? They still have not come back. Uh, Mr. Hank Johnson of Georgia, would you like to take your five minutes at this time? I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yes, I would. Uh, thank you for holding this very uh, important hearing. Voting rights is not going away, even though the Senate last night failed to do what it should have done. And in some respects, we can call it a racist Senate. Um, the same way that we can talk about racism when it comes to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle making statements today about black people and Democrats race baiting. It's like, you know, when you mention about how much of racism still exists in the soil of America, they wanna plant their heads in that soil and uh, refuse to acknowledge what's in the soil. And it's, um, they've been emboldened now, Mr. Chairman, um, you know, I, my colleague from Texas, I'm sure, would not have felt comfortable in talking like he spoke um, three or four years ago. Mr. But Roy, because he's, he's back with us, I appreciate a Republican being with us. I just want to make that known. We're, we're good. Because of the election of Donald Trump and the Make America White Again movement, he feels empowered 
to be able to say what he wants to say. He knows that it's wrong, but he feels entitled. He feels privileged. It's white privilege. It's white power that allows him to say what he said. And uh, I'm just blown away by, by where we have fallen in our discourse on this committee. But at any rate, we heard about Mr. Henderson, I'd like to ask you, Georgia is one of the nation's fastest growing states and this growth has largely been driven by people of color. Over the last decade, Georgia's black population grew by 16%, almost half a million people, while the population of white Georgians has decreased. And yet the new legislative maps do not reflect this tremendous growth of Georgia's black population. Mr. Henderson, the Supreme Court has declared partisan gerrymandering challenges a non-justiciable political question, but it has continuously held that states may not engage in intentional racial gerrymandering. Is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Johnson. That is correct. And to be, and to be clear, district maps are presumptively unconstitutional when race is the predominant motivating factor in the legislature's redrawing of congressional and legislative maps, correct? That is also correct. How are you able to show uh, race as a motivating factor? You know, I think, uh, thank you for the question. And my colleague, uh, Tom Sines, who represents uh, Maldiv, I thought ably answered uh, that question in response uh, to an earlier inquiry. It is extremely difficult uh, to establish the fact pattern necessary to show that uh, uh, redistricting was based uh, exclusively on race or predominantly on race. And it makes challenging uh, redistricting uh, in a way that uh, would show uh, racial uh, gerrymandering extremely difficult to accomplish. One has to look at the totality of circumstances and deduce uh, from those circumstances that race was the predominant factor. And that is extremely hard to do. I'm now quite familiar with what's going on in Arizona because in a meeting recently with Senator Sinema to point out why having a debate on voting rights was so necessary, we pointed out the uh, uh, demographic changes that have taken place in that state uh, over the past uh, 10 years. Uh, we pointed out uh, the fact uh, that uh, since the Shelby County decision, 320 polling places in Arizona were closed. 70% of poll, uh, polling places in Maricopa County, the most diverse county in the state have been closed. And at the same time, the legislature adopted recently a, a limitation on mail-in voting, which Arizonans used 80% of the population. When you combine those factors together, the heavy reliance on mail-in balloting, the closure of polling places, and restrictions that affect Native American households because of their lack of mailing addresses, other information. When you look at the attacks on election workers that have occurred in the aftermath of the 2020 election and the fraudulent review of uh, voting procedures conducted by the so-called cyber ninjas in Arizona, the first of its kind, the totality of circumstances lays a foundation which allows you to help evaluate both what's happening in the election process and the gerrymandering circumstance, but others I may see. be familiar with uh, Georgia specifically. Mr. Johnson, your time is up, I believe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just uh, leave with the fact that it would only be, it, well, it would be only six blind mice on the Supreme Court who could not be able to look through the facade and under a total under a totality of the circumstances uh, rule correctly. And I'm not confident that uh, that will happen. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We are now at, a, at an unusual time in our hearing in that we have Mr. Garcia, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, Mr. Garcia, who could not testify because he had technical difficulties is now with us. I will yield to the uh, desires of the minority who are with us now, Mr. Johnson, the ranking member, and Mr. Roy, the acting ranking member. Would you like for Mr. Garcia to proceed with this testimony now, or would you prefer that we wait until after we, you have your opportunity to question witnesses, each of you? 
uh, or, 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 or or what what would be your preference? I don't want to discriminate. I, I would uh, defer to uh, my colleague from Louisiana. My instinct would be to allow the witness, out of deference and respect for his time, to allow the witness to go ahead and testify, and then we can we'll be happy to join in after. And I apologize. I'm. I don't proxy vote. I was down on the floor of the House, so uh, sorry I wasn't back here. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Mr. Johnson, is that okay with you to have Mr. Garcia testify now? Perfectly fine, my friend. And let me just say briefly, I, my staff told me that you were making some comments about Republicans not being on, but we were, as you know, in the middle of a vote series, and we don't vote by proxy, so we had to be on the floor. So happy to let Mr. Garcia testify. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Many of you do vote by proxy, though. Uh, you just have a lawsuit, but many of you do use that. Mr. Garcia, you are to be recognized now, and, and I think uh, uh, I, I don't have my material before me. Uh, I know you represent LULAC, and you have uh, uh, represented them over the years. You're recognized for five minutes, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Domingo Garcia, and I'm from Dallas, Texas, and I'm the national president of LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens, the nation's oldest uh, Latino civil rights organization and the largest. And we're here because, unfortunately, since 1970, uh, we've had to file suits in Texas and all over the country to protect the voting rights of Mexican-Americans and Latinos throughout the United States and Puerto Rico. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit primarily about Texas. From 2010 to 2020, 90 percent of the population growth in Texas was predominantly Latino and people of color. Uh, as a result of that, Texas uh, was the only state that got two congressional districts. We would have assumed that because of the large Latino growth, that we would have had two Latino opportunity congressional districts in Texas. Uh, uh, but after the uh, meetings of the Texas legislature, I testified there. We gave the numbers, even though Latino districts could have been created in Dallas, Fort Worth, in uh, Harris County, Houston, and in South uh, Central Texas around Austin, San Antonio, none, no districts were created. Uh, literally, you could have just made squares you could have made triangles and you would have created uh, Latino opportunity districts because we are, Texas is now a majority minority state, one of only six in the country, but that didn't happen. And what happened was you had extreme weaponization of gerrymandering for political purposes. And by the way, we're nonpartisan. We don't support Democrats or Republicans. We just believe in fairness and equity in the process. So whether it's you know, Democrats doing it to the Republicans, Republicans doing it to Democrats. Our concern is just that everybody has a seat or an opportunity to have a seat at the table. And that did not occur uh, during this congressional redistricting in Texas. As a result, we believe that uh, the plans that were adopted by Texas in regards to Congress, the state Senate, uh, the state House, and the state Board of Education were intentionally discriminatory. You have to go out of your way and create wiggle lines, like the, the gerrymanders that we learn about in social studies courses about what used to happen out in, uh, in the 1890s in New York. Well, that hap is happening in 2022 in Texas. And uh, we believe that the only way we can protect the voting rights of Latinos, uh, African-Americans and Native Americans uh, in, the, in the entire country is by passing protections that will, prote uh, that will take care of Latinos. For example, uh, Congressman Roy, I know you're from Texas. Look, I've been, I was a former state representative, but Texas had an only whites primary. Texas had a poll tax that my grandfather paid because that you had to pay five, I believe $2.50 at that time, you're pulling about 20 bucks today to vote. And that was to intentionally keep people, black and brown people from voting. Literacy tests were passed to make sure that if you couldn't read or write the Texas constitution verbatim, you couldn't vote. Okay. That was a test. How many uh, jelly beans in a jar to do math? Uh, all of those happen. And when we see voter ID, when you see all these efforts to stop people from voting, think about this. What happened in Texas was we used to have, you know, every every senior in Harris County got an application, an application to vote by mail, not a ballot, just an application. And the Texas, uh, the Texas legislature passed a law saying, no, so you know what? You can't do that. You can't get more people to vote. We got to restrict the number of people to vote. We can't have 24 hour voting so that people that are working third and fourth, fifth shifts, primarily poor working people, can have an opportunity to vote just like more well off middle class people. No, we're not going to, we're going to stop that. By the way, I'm, I'm in Dallas County. If I go register somebody to vote in San Antonio, Austin, or Houston, I commit a felony. If I help my neighbor, a senior, vote by mail, and I help them fill out the ballot because maybe they're bed stricken or maybe their eyes not. I commit a felony. 
That's what we've come to in Texas, the criminalization of voting. To make it so difficult that they have to rig the system instead of going for the hearts and minds of voters. And the fact of the matter is Latinos uh, are, are pretty much an independent group. We're socially conservative. We, we're pro-police. We're pro-ICE. Uh, we're, you know, we're split on, on abortion. Republicans have made inroads. But you can't rig the system like we saw in the state Senate. There are no Latinos uh, from, the, from Dallas County. Uh, and we're, we have more, the largest Latino population without a congressional district or a state Senate district. In the state house, it could have been additional Latino district created in Midland and Nectar County, in Tarrant County, in Harris County, and in Caldwell County. None of that happened. Uh, and that's why we believe that we are asking that a voting rights bill be passed to protect the, the rights of every citizen to have a fair shot at voting. And that's not what we're seeing today in Texas. And by the way, LULAC is involved in litigation in Iowa, Arizona, Florida, uh, because unfortunately, Again, we are seeing these voter suppression tactics to keep Jose and Maria and everybody else that may be with a last name like Garcia from voting or making it so difficult that the numbers go down. And already we see numbers like for mail ballots, 50 percent of the mail ballots in Travis County have been rejected. Why? Because for the first time, uh, Texas required that you add your Social Security number or your driver's license to your application. And many seniors are forgetting to do that. And therefore, their mail ballots are being rejected. So it's a thank you, Mr. Garcia. We, we, we thank you for getting your technology corrected and we appreciate your testimony. And I want to thank Mr. Roy for his courtesies in allowing you to testify at this at that point, which I think was appropriate. Now, which Mr. Johnson or Mr. Roy, whoever you choose, will go first for the five minute question. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that's oh well, Mike, what's your call? Go ahead, Chip. I'll defer to you if you want to go first. Uh, all right, well, I'll go uh, at that, if that's what you prefer. Mr. Um, Roy, ask for five minutes. Thank you. All right. Well, I think, I think the chairman, uh, and I would, uh, I had a few questions I was going to ask, but it, <laughs> I feel compelled to address a few of the things that have been discussed, um, in part, probably in somewhat in my absence, and I, I, I get, understand why that's the case, um, but I said I was on the floor voting, and we're talking about proxy voting. It's not just about a lawsuit. Uh, some of us believe that it is unconstitutional and wrong to proxy vote, and we we can disagree on that, uh, but I have put my money where my mouth is, and I'm not voting by proxy. That has caused all sorts of complications in my existence in a world where the Congress is continuing to vote by proxy, uh, and I've got competing engagements, and I can't multitask uh, if I'm voting in person. So uh, that is a real issue, and we ought to address it, and I think it's tearing apart the House of Representatives. I would also note that uh, uh, my colleague, Mr. Johnson, uh, comma Hank, not Mike, uh, was making um, some comments about my alleged white privilege. Um, you know, I, I think it would be noteworthy if were my grandmother still alive, uh, who was uh, raised in West Texas to a single mom in a house with dirt and no indoor plumbing, and my uh, grandfather, who was the same, and my grandmother's father, who was a orphan, uh, as a result of, we believe, I'm not going to claim any percentage of uh, Native American lineage, but uh, we believe by family uh, passing down that that was the case, and that was a part of his re reason for being an orphan, uh, and growing up dirt poor during the Depression, and grand my great-grandfather losing the farm, uh, and then my dad uh, working hard and going to college despite having polio, uh, which I know the chairman uh, can uh, very much relate with. Uh, I would question the uh, uh, assertion of my, quote, privilege and, and white power, or that I wouldn't comment on the absurdity of these race-based uh, focus with respect to legislation on, on elections uh, when I've been doing so my entire life, including being a lawyer on the Senate Judiciary Committee when I worked hard for Senator Cornyn when we were working on the legislation of the Voting Rights Act in 2006, which has been referenced here, to make very clear that it was clearly unconstitutional, that the data that it was being based upon was 1968 data, that the case was not made for the reauthorization of Section 5 to be applied to the districts according to a formula that was 50 years old, that it was clear it would be tossed out on its head, that it was then therefore tossed out on its head in 2013. And I'm proud to have taken part in helping draft the minority views, uh, additional views to the record uh, to make the case because it was wrong. And it was wrong then and it would be wrong now. And that's the reality. And with my, uh, the, the former uh, Representative Garcia, I'm glad to have you here and I was happy to defer to you to, to offer your testimony. 
um, when we're talking about Texas law, I hear you. OK, and I've, I've talked to many people who experienced those issues with respect to uh, the uh, hor horrors of poll taxes and uh, literacy tests and what that meant to disenfranchise voters. But now you're comparing that and analogizing. You made the case, sir, of what we're saying. You're making the case and analogizing it to voter identification. Yes, voter ID is a, uh, a necessary tool for ensuring the integrity of ballots and elections, particularly in Texas, where in particular, our borders are wide open right now. We've literally had a million people come to the United States and be released uh, into the United States over the last year due to the complete and utter incompetence, and not just incompetence, but malicious refusal to actually enforce the laws of the United States, to know who's in the United States. For the rationale for having voter ID is being made by the very administration who's accusing states of being racist for wanting to have voter identification to ensure the integrity of the elections when they refuse to defend the sovereignty of the United States. Those are the facts. We know what the numbers are in Texas, and we see what's actually happening. And fi a final point on uh, the gentleman's commentary about um, Mr. Charlie Sippert, who uh, uh, I believe passed away this last year. I'm trying to remember my timeline, um, but was obviously noteworthy for uh, being, as some people would call the Jackie Robinson of golf. Um, and we're not here to talk about golf, but I do want to raise an issue. that When I was a, in college and was a walk-on on the golf team at college, there was uh, a young man who was a dear friend who has since passed away, unfortunately, from uh, meningitis, uh, viral meningitis, while he was playing on the Canadian tour, uh, trying to make it, uh, Louis Chitangua. Uh, he was the first black to win the South African Open, and he was my dear friend. And uh, he uh, broke that color barrier, and we would talk at length. Uh, and yes, he, like other Black Americans, faced racism in 1990s in Virginia. I, it, it, and we'd have conversations about that. You want to talk about privilege. He would talk extensively about the privilege of being an American and the privilege of what it means to be an American and having faced uh, what he faced in Zimbabwe uh, and, and going over and winning the, the uh, tournament in South Africa. I know my time is up, Mr. Chairman. I like to try to keep the clock, but um, I'm well aware of the importance of these issues. I, I come at it from a very different perspective, however, about the integrity of elections and uh, not using a uh, race for, for political purposes. And one final point, and I know I'm over my time and appreciate the indulgence, is that with respect to uh, the, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I had another point. So I'll, I'll defer and, and yield back to the chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Roy. If you come back with your thought, you'll be, I'll give you an opportunity to, to express it. Um, Thanks, sir. Ms. Ms. Ross has got uh, time. Mr. Raskin has seniority, but I'm going to recognize Ms. Ross because she has a John Kennedy picture in the screen, and I think Mr. Raskin is great at batting cleanup. Ms. Ross, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, just wanted Mr. Raskin to know that I got my copy of Vogue magazine today with a big feature on him and his book and his family, and um, he is not only an excellent member of the committee, but a celebrity in Vogue now, so congratulations to him for that. Um, I also want to thank everybody who came to testify today, and um, you know, this is such an important issue. And right now it is front of mind for the American people because of what's going on on the Senate side. But in North Carolina, it has been front of mind for centuries. Um, I'm a former civil rights attorney and a state legislator from North Carolina. And I've witnessed firsthand efforts to reduce the power of minority voters in my home state through racial gerrymandering and voter suppression laws. Last week, a three-judge panel upheld North Carolina's new maps for U.S. Congress, the United, the North Carolina Senate, and the North Carolina General Assembly. These maps are intended to further reduce Democratic representation, an outcome that's also likely to dilute the power of minority voters and reduce minority representation in, at both the state and federal level. While this is not the outcome I had hoped for, the panel did establish key findings about the unequal nature of these maps and laid the foundation for the state Supreme Court to rule against partisan gerrymandering on appeal under the state constitution. 
The recent efforts in my state to undermine the continuance of American democracy highlight the importance of passing federal voting rights legislation to ensure that our governing institutions reflect the diverse communities they represent. And it's consistent with our history. Finally, I want to correct a misconception that members of both parties have, that expanding voting rights only helps Democrats at the ballot box. In 2020, the North, Car North Carolina offered the longest voting period in the country, largely because we're a military state. The State Board of Elections mailed absentee ballot to voters 60 days before the November 3rd election, earlier than any state. In-person early voting was open for 19 days prior to the election, and same-day voter registration was allowed at all early voting locations because of a bill I worked on when I was in the state legislature. Because our state made voting so convenient, North Carolina saw record voter turnout in 2020, with 75% of voters casting ballots. Because of, not despite, the ease of access to the ballots, Republicans secured victories across the state, including Donald Trump. North Carolina's experience shows that progressive voting laws do not uniformly benefit Democrats and disadvantage Republicans. Instead, they serve the interest of candidates from both parties who can most effectively energize and inspire our state's closely divided electorate. My question is for both um, Sherilyn Eiffel and Derek Johnson. Please describe the impact of North Carolina's congressional and legislative maps, the current ones, on the voting rights of minority citizens. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the question. I will uh, concede that um, LDF has not um, mounted a challenge around the North Carolina congressional maps, although I am familiar with uh, what you have described and it very much reflects what we are seeing in multiple states. Um, we heard reference to it in Georgia from Representative uh, McBath. We are seeing this in Alabama. Um, we've seen this in South Carolina. Um, and we're closely watching Louisiana where members of the LDF staff are today testifying in Baton Rouge. And that is that the growth in the black and Latino population in these states, and I guess Tom Sian referenced this as well, is not being reflected in the congressional maps that are being drawn. This is the equivalent of erasing uh, our population and the representation to which they are entitled and deserve. Uh, as I said earlier, this is not only at the congressional level, it's not only at the state house level, but we're also seeing it in county commission races, in judicial districts, in school board districts as well. This is what the project really has been about. We all know that uh, gerrymandered maps get grandfathered from decade to decade. They constitute what becomes a permanent lockout or a permanent diminution oh. of voting strength for racial minorities. And so when we see this going forward, when we see the failure to take account of uh, the population increases that have happened, largely racial minority population increases uh, within these maps, this is directly a threat to the full citizenship and representation of uh, people who have a right to have their numbers properly reflected uh, in, in districting maps. This, our work this year, that's what it's all about. It's about ensuring that we can try and Ms. Eiffel, our time is up. reverse uh, the, the gerrymandered districts that have shut our communities out of full voting strength for now decades. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Ross, I appreciate it. Uh, now I'd like to recognize Mr. Johnson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize we've been in and out. As, as uh, Mr. Roy explained, uh, not, neither he nor I, many of our colleagues, Republican side, have voted proxy. And uh, because we do believe it's unconstitutional, we're litigating that, as you know. I think it would have been an appropriate uh, subject for our committee to hear at some point, but it uh, was not to occur. So I um, apologize for being in and out today. Look, I think I, I've lost count on our Constitution subcommittee, but I this may be the seventh hearing, I think, that we've had on this subject um, in the last year. And um, listen, the integrity of our election system is of critical importance. I mean, we all agree on that. And I know that people try to make this a partisan thing, but it, it should not be. 
Um, but every Republican that I know, and I, I'm a former state legislator in Louisiana, I know many uh, legislators uh, on the Republican side around the country at the state level, and of course, everyone here in Congress, all of the, my constituents, the party activists, every single Republican that I know wants every eligible voter to participate in our elections. See, the thing about our party is we believe in the original principles of our nation, the, the foundational principles. And we know that free and fair elections are central to all of that. So all the claims that are made, these wild accusations about the supposed intentions of Republican lawmakers around the country are just completely unfounded. You ought to take some time to go talk to these folks and see what they're really about, and what they're trying to accomplish. The, the Democrats in Congress are, are, are seeking to commandeer the state redistricting processes in order to enrich themselves politically. I mean, it's just, it's, it's brazenly uh, political and it's obvious to anybody who looks into this. I mean, Washington Democrats are politicizing the VRA, the Voting Rights Act, by, by seeking to overturn common sense and lawful state election integrity reforms. L look at the example in Georgia. It's been discussed today from mostly one side, but the Biden Department of Justice filed suit against the state of Georgia over that new election law, SB 202. That, that law, if, if anybody at home can Google this and, and research it for themselves, don't listen to what pundits and supposed experts are saying about it. Look at the law. It strengthens ballot box protections. It enhances the state's election integrity. And that's why it was popularly supported there. But uh, one of the experts that, who's testified in this committee before on election laws stated that the DOJ's complaint, the lawsuit, that the Biden administration filed against that Georgia law, quote, reads more like a press release from the Democratic National Committee than a serious lawsuit by an apolitical justice department, unquote. And, and this is the theme that we've returned to over and over uh, in this year, when we had Attorney General Merrick Garland before us and, and, and all the other hearings that we've had on these subjects and others related to it. Th the people are losing faith not only in our election system for all the accusations that are flying back and forth, but, but more importantly than that, perhaps, in our entire system of justice. They're losing faith in our institutions. The idea that there is equal justice under law, that justice is blind, because they're seeing the Department of Justice, justice being weaponized for political purposes. That is something that should greatly concern us. All this is uh, being done for politics in Washington, and it's a shame. It violates our constitutional order. It violates our, our principles. It is the states that have the authority to do these things. And the Supreme Court has ruled recently, we've covered this ad nauseum, that the conditions that existed in 1965 simply do not exist today. There is no evidence of widespread voter suppression or voter discrimination or any of that. This is not about race at all. The, the, the legislators that I know, the ones that are working in all these states, Republican and Democrat, are trying to ensure that the elections are fair and free so that the people do not lose their faith and, and the integrity of the ballot box. If we lose that, y'all, we, we lose everything. And everybody should agree with that. I only have one minute left. Maybe I, I'll, I'll ask our minority witness, Ms. Rorden, if there's anything that's been said she'd like to comment on, because I know she may not have another opportunity. I'll, I'll give the time to her. Um, well, thank you for that. And I just want to say that um, I really think that in my experience within the Justice Department, um, the amount of cases that we reviewed during the time that I was there doing Section 5 from 2000 until 2013, when the Shelby County decision was made, um, the amount of objections that we had at that time, Congressman, was 0.36 of 1% of all of the submissions, um, you know, that were submitted. And what people don't realize is the amount of work that goes into making a submission to the Department of Justice and then the politics that are played by the department in reviewing them. And um, I, don't, I don't make those accusations uh, lightly. Um, I, I find it to be very uh, disheartening, um, but I will say that I don't believe that their actions in the past justify them getting that type of control over state um, election law again. It's very well said, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. And I just, I don't think you were here when I told you to people about Everett Dirksen, who's over my head and behind me. He had that argument made in 1964 by Southern uh, legislators that it was up to the states. He worked out compromises 
to make it acceptable to them that they still none of them voted for the Civil Rights or the Voting Rights Act, whichever Dirksen did and all the Republicans did then when it was the party of Lincoln. I now yield. Jamie, you're not going to be our cleanup hitter because we now have two other powerful hitters, and Miss Bush and Miss Jackson Lee, but you're going to go at this present time to recognize the Honorable Jamie Raskin. For Mr. Five. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, before I begin, did Ms. McBath want to take a moment? or had, she's, had, she's spoken twice. Thank you. She okay. recognized and thank you no, for your offer. She's here. Um, I, I heard my friend, Mr. Roy, uh, right when I got back to the office. I did, unfortunately, I didn't hear what prompted him to you know, launch into uh, a defense of his family and so on. Um, but I was moved by what he had to say. Um, and it reminded me that um, that American history has been transformed by coalitions between African Americans and members of other uh, disadvantaged minority groups and working class white people who also have been uh, targeted for political exclusion and disenfranchisement. I'm just wondering uh, whether you know Ms. Eiffel or Mr. Sands would want to opine about that there are certain disenfranch disenfranchising mechanisms like the white primaries in Texas, you know, the subject of Smith versus All Right and Terry versus Adams, which were racially specific. Um, uh, literacy tests, I think, were used that way. But there also were a bunch of them that were targeted at both the African-American population and the white working class, like poll taxes, I think, were um, imposed across the board. And I just wonder, um, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure what got Mr. Roy upset about what someone had said, but I don't think anybody would deny that there have been white people disenfranchised, certainly under the wealth and property qualifications that America began with. What we're fighting for is universal voting rights for everybody. So I don't know, Ms. Eiffel, Ms. Science, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, let me see if I can do this very quickly because um, Congressman Raskin, thank you for the question. I feel I must respond to Congressman Johnson about the supposed frivolity of lawsuits challenging the Georgia uh, voter suppression law. Uh, LDF is challenging the voter suppression law. We're also challenging the voter suppression law in Florida. And in both cases, uh, the judge in, in Georgia, a Trump appointee, has denied the state's motion to dismiss which tells you that these are not frivolous claims. These are not press releases. These are legitimate cases that will go forward and the courts will decide uh, the uh, strength of those claims. Uh, Congressman Raskin, absolutely, and certainly many of the provisions that we think about, automatic voter registration, absentee voting, when we talk about drop boxes outside the uh, Board of Elections, the people they most benefit are those who are disabled uh, and the elderly. We should be expanding the vote for everyone. Texas's voter ID law that we successfully challenged, our, our client in that case was a student at a Texas state university who could no longer use her student ID to vote, uh, but of course could if she had a concealed gun carry permit. But that also doesn't mean that we deny the targeting of black and brown voters that have happened that has happened in the country since uh, we received the right to vote uh, after the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. The voting right. Was designed to address that for a reason, and we can't deny that history simply by pointing to the fact that there has been widespread oppression across the board of many people without wealth. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Science. Did you want to add anything to that? I would just add that, that your point is absolutely accurate. Voting rights laws benefit everyone. We see collateral disenfranchise when it comes to voter ID, which often has a, a very significant impact based on class and economics. In Arizona, we found that the attempt to restrict voter registration, new registrants being required to produce a birth certificate or other proof of citizenship, had effects on young voters of all races who were choosing to register for the first time, and on the elderly who had difficulty obtaining the proof of their citizenship. So it is absolutely true that there are collateral disenfranchise and that voting rights laws, like all civil rights laws, benefit every American. I think we're in this situation today because of the Supreme Court's uh, successful efforts to gut the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County versus Holder and the Brnovich decision. There's been a, a war from the bench um, uh, against the Voting Rights Act, against civil rights legislation generally. Um, are we at a point when we can recognize that federal statutes, including the, the most powerful voting rights statute we ever had, the Voting Rights Act 65, are not enough? And we need a constitutional amendment guaranteeing the right to vote because all we've got is sort of a ragtag sequence of anti-discrimination amendments 
You can't discriminate on the basis of race, the 15th Amendment on the basis of gender, the 19th Amendment. So nowhere do you have what exists in most democratic con constitutions, which is a universal grant of the right to vote to all citizens at every level of government. Is it time for us to do that? Mr. Henderson, let me start with you. Thank you, Mr. Raskin, for the question. It's a very important uh, question. And I believe you are right that a constitutional amendment guaranteeing the right to vote to all American citizens would be a powerful tool that would help resolve many of the disputes that we're talking about now. Having said that, the likely adoption and ratification of such an amendment is virtually impossible. One need only look at what's going on now with an effort to restore the Voting Rights Act of 1965 based on the requirements imposed by the Supreme Court in the Shelby County decision. Many of us believe that the court offered a roadmap uh, to the appropriate reauthorization of that uh, act, even if we disagreed with the holding itself. But there are some who suggest that the court cynically established a challenge which it knew quite well would be impossible to achieve based on the fact that there was inherent skepticism about the uh, effort to uh, really establish the existence of discrimination. We think the House Judiciary Committee and the Senate have helped modernize the formula that the court required be considered in an update of the Voting Rights Act. Okay, but let me, I, I wanna, if I could pause court. you there, Mr. Henderson, I just wanted to ask the minority witness whether you would agree to a constitutional amendment establishing a right of all citizens to vote. Ms. Rodin. Yes, I would. So, and, and, that, and that would, I think, would be the best answer, Ms. Henderson. Maybe we could get people together around the principle of a constitutional right to vote. I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your indulgence. Thank you, Mr. Raskin. I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Roy, are you with us again? I see your camera's on. If not, I was going to let him out of the sand trap that he was in when he left us. Uh, he's apparently so. I, I would, Mr. Uh, any, Mr. John, do you have any other Republicans no. there? I, I don't believe so. No. Okay, well, let's go next, I guess, to Ms. Uh, Ms. Bush. Ms. Bush, you're recognized for five minutes. St. Louis, and I thank you, Chairman Cohen, for convening this important hearing. We are all in the midst of a moral crisis, and we know that. Last night, the nation watched as the United States Senate failed to advance legislation that would protect our fundamental and constitutional right to vote. And for what? Because of fear, white fear, because of power, white power. Fear that if and when we empower black people, that will somehow disempower white people. That if we empower brown, brown people, the brown community, that that will somehow disempower white people. White people, especially white wealthy people, have long exercised control over our democracy because the mere idea of black folks possessing even an ounce of political power is viewed as a threat to the status quo. So to those apathetic white folks who have felt yet, who have yet to welcome love and welcome anti-racism into your hearts, my question for you is this, what are you afraid of? Are you afraid that we will end redlining? Are you afraid that we will deliver universal health care? Are you afraid that we will end police violence, that we will end the racial and gender wealth gaps, that we will provide safe housing for every single member of our unhoused community, that we will end our forever wars? Are you afraid that we will end mass, mass criminalization? Are you afraid that we will dismantle the comfy white supremacy that many benefit from? Because that's the world I want to live in, and that's the world we should all want to live in. W.E.B. Du Bois once wrote, if there was one thing South Carolina feared more than bad Negro government, it was good Negro government. Hmm. And perhaps this here is the fear, fear that we will build the kind of political power that is just, that is equitable, and that will lead to transformative policy change. Mr. Henderson, can you please explain how current voting rights challenges, if left unaddressed, are not only a danger to the participation of black communities, but also a danger to the overall health of our democracy. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Bush, for your question. And you are absolutely right. 
Uh, African-American voters historically have been the canary in the mine. Their treatment as a group has helped establish the standard by which we evaluate uh, voting rights on behalf of all of our citizens. Obviously, a recognition that other groups have experienced discrimination is important. Uh, I think Tom Sines and, and others have established the uh, effect of uh, discrimination on Latino voters. We've seen the same with Asian American and Native American voters. And subgroups like uh, uh, individuals with disabilities uh, and older Americans often face challenges. However, the uh, use of uh, racial considerations in trying to decide who is entitled to vote has created a pernicious system that indeed as now being assembled does reflect uh, what I think is a Jim Crow 2.0. I know Mr. Nobile uh, disagrees with that characterization, but I think there is ample justification for the use of that term and it is not hyperbolic. Uh, my own sense is that uh, democracy is very much uh, in peril right now. Yeah. I think we have seen that in very significant ways. And I think the failure to enhance protections for all voters, as has been noted previously, will undercut the power of American democracy to survive the challenges yeah. we face today. Thank you so much, Mr. Henderson, and thank, thank you for you. all your work. And yes, this here Black woman would, would, would characterize it as a Jim Crow 2.0. Um, Ms. Eiffel, the Legal Defense Fund has done significant work to end prison-based gerrymandering, which counts those who are incarcerated as residents of districts where they are incarcerated and not in districts where they are actually from, all the while denying many of these community members a voice and a vote. This in turn distorts the census count in voting districts. What harms does prison, uh, prison gerrymandering pose to Black voters? Thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman Bush. This is the place where uh, voting discrimination intertwines with the longstanding discrimination in our criminal justice system that results in um, Black and, and Latino Americans being disproportionately represented in prisons around the country. Um, prisons are often located in rural majority white areas. Um, they um, very often are uh, places where employment opportunities exist for correctional officers, particularly for white correctional officers. Uh, and when those who are incarcerated disproportionately black and brown are counted as part of those rural districts where they are not residents, then that means that all of the collateral consequences of counting them there flow as well. And that includes funding, um, plans around uh, development and, and business um, and jobs and so on and so forth. When in fact, they should be counted in their home communities because most people who are in prison will go home. We know that when we count in the census and we do our districting, it lasts for 10 years, but most people will be home before then. And it essentially means that resources are that should be allocated to communities of color in places like where I'm sitting right now, Baltimore City, are instead allocated to places in that are rural and that are majority white. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, we can no longer appeal to the moral conscience of white moderates, as Dr. King um, warned. We now know that our fight is an existential one. It demands that we ask ourselves fundamental questions about what we stand for as a country. Do we stand for white supremacy or do we stand uh, for, uh, do we, um, do we stand for white supremacy or anti-racism? Do we stand for a politics of fear or politics of opportunity? That is what is at stake. Thank you so much. And I yield back. Mr. Chairman, we can't hear you, sir. You're muted. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Thank you. Uh, I said, if Mr. Johnson's walking the halls. If he'd like to stop and, and say anything, he'd be welcome to. He doesn't, I guess. Anyway, I now recognize. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pass, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Having technical difficulties here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I now recognize the lady represents the district of Barbara Jordan, I believe, if not the district, the spirit, and one of the great leaders whose names were sponsors of the 2006 law. It was the, the Betty Lou Hamer bill, as well as the uh, Rosa Parks and the uh, 
she, uh, Barbara Jordan bill in 19, 2006. Ms. Sheila Jackson Lee for five minutes. Chairman, thank you for this timely hearing and thank you for reminding us of that moment in history. I was pleased to be able to add my predecessor and mentor, the Honorable Barbara Jordan's name to that bill in terms of its absolute unity between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, I was crushed last night about 1030 uh, as a sinister act uh, was uh, uh, performed on the floor of the United States Senate, and that is the defeat of a talking filibuster that would have led to the opportunity uh, for the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, in the words of uh, Dr. King paraphrased, uh, justice was crushed and certainly the righteousness of rolling waters did not exist. And so I believe that it is crucial for this hearing today, but also to take up uh, the words of the president of the NAACP, as was indicated on the floor of the Senate. We are not finished. Uh, we will continue. And my recommendation is for the Senate uh, to institute debate and to continue uh, to place this on the floor of the United States Senate until it is passed. Uh, we're in a road uh, that is going nowhere if we continue on the pathway that we are. Let me start by saying that it is my belief that race is a crucial factor uh, in the efforts uh, that we've seen, sadly, uh, by our friends on the other side of the aisle. I did not call them racist, but I said racism is an extreme factor in the denial of voting rights. And I listened to uh, the uh, minority witness, we welcome her, uh, to describe uh, persons at the Justice Department for different views as left-wing persons only because they want to enhance the power of the vote. Let me also be very clear that Section 4 indicates in the Constitution that the Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations. In listening to Senator Klobuchar, uh, I want to make sure that it is not the Founding Fathers' desire that it be the tyranny of the minority. In fact, Thomas Jefferson said, it's my principle that the will of the majority should always prevail. The idle principle of Republican government is the will of the majority. That did not um, occur uh, as we proceeded. Uh, we've been stifled by the minority. So I want to focus uh, on the question of race and voting, if I might. Um, and I, I want to go to Sherilyn Eiffel. In a, a discourse on the floor of the House, Senator Collins, excuse me, on the Senate last evening, tried to suggest that Section 2 was a substitute for Section 5. Uh, certainly, Senator Ossoff did a beautiful job, but, but let us uh, understand, and my time is short, uh, how, uh, how crucial it is of Section 5 and that it is a poor comparison, though we welcome Section 2, uh, to suggest that that is the answer uh, to voting rights violations. Thank you very much, Congresswoman uh, Jackson Lee. Section 5 and Section 2 were meant to complement each other. Uh, but the preferred way of addressing uh, voting discrimination was Section 5, which is to have a mechanism to catch voting discrimination before it's implemented and to avoid the long periods of time and the high cost of litigation that uh, Tom Sienz referred to later. So the first resort was Section 5 and the pre process, which essentially uh, Tom Sienz calls alternative dispute resolution. Let me use an example from Texas, your state. When Texas passed its voter ID law, uh, we filed suit almost immediately. This was after the Shelby County decision removed preclearance. This was a voter ID law that Texas had been unable to get precleared years earlier. The law went into effect. We litigated. We ultimately won. And then we went up to the appeals court. And then we came back down. And we also ultimately completed and settled the case for 2018. Thank but you. 2014 and 18, that discriminatory discriminatory voter ID law was in place. It should never have been in place. And that's why we need section five. But when it, when it doesn't, when it slips through the cracks, then we need section two to be able to litigate and challenge uh, discriminatory voter. Thank voter. you. My time is short. And I want to ask uh, Mr. Johnson, president of the NAACP. And I know he knows that the Niagara movement started in West Virginia, where Senator Manchin uh, is representing. And then to Wade Henderson, I want to get to this question of race, uh, not to be able to uh, throw racism around, but every time voters who happen to be of color uh, seem to be making a legitimate legal headway, like Texas, for example, they've criminalized voting infractions. Please comment on that uh, because we will not move forward if we cannot understand what the underpinnings of voter suppression is. Mr. President, 
of the NAACP way. Appreciate your comments. And I'd also appreciate the comments of Mr. Sines if my president would allow them, my chairman allow them to answer. Mr. Chairman, well, Mr. Johnson. First of all, the vote is the currency in any democracy. And, and as we've, we've heard here, many people are conflating race with partisanship. For African-Americans, we want to fully engage and participate and not be criminalized, nor be put in a partisan bucket because we want to have fair and equal representation and the ability to elect candidates of our choice. And so the two examples that was used, both Texas and North Carolina, you're seeing tremendous growth in populations in Texas as a result of uh, 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 the Latino community and, and in North Carolina, both Latino and Black community, and the representation as a result of redistricting is lacking. And so for, for African Americans, for the Latino community, we want to be able to fully engage, to deposit our currency in this democracy for clear representation and not be criminalized for that, not be penalized for that, but stand up as full citizens in this country. Thank you, Mr. Henderson, Mr. Sines, Mr. Henderson. Uh, Ms. Woman, thank you for the question. Um, I defer, first of all, Derek Johnson is a vice chair of the leadership conference and I associate myself with his remarks. And I'd now like to defer to my other vice chair, Tom Sines, to give him an opportunity to speak to that question as well. Thank you so very much, Mr. Henderson. Mr. Sines, and welcome. Thank you. As you know, your state, Texas, is one of a number of states on the cutting edge of change in this country. And that's a demographic change that is unprecedented. And we have the chance to demonstrate what democracies do in response to demographic change. And what they appropriately do is work to incorporate everyone in the franchise and let them all vote when they have the right to do so. Instead, what we see is a reaction to demographic change, unfortunately in Texas, repeated in other parts of the country, that is to suppress the vote, particularly of those groups that are becoming of a size that is viewed as a threat to the powers that be. So this is really about the opportunity to demonstrate that racial demographic change can still preserve the democracy that we have in this country. And Texas, as you know, is right at the cutting edge of these issues. Thank you so very much, Mr. Chairman. May I submit into the record these documents, please? Without objection, so done. Uh, may I just call their names out? Texas election officials are rejecting hundreds of vote by mail applications and it's going on as we speak. Uh, voting rights is a constitutional right, an article by myself in the uh, Hill article uh, dealing with uh, the uh, putting together of two African-American members in the redistricting plan put together in September, 2021. Washington Post, New Texas Republican map carves uh, Jackson Lee district out and a statement of the mayor of the city of Houston about the voter registration shortage right now existing in the state of Texas where people cannot be registered because we do not have any voting card. Voting suppression glaring in Texas and other states. And as I indicate uh, to Ms. Beck Bath, I thank her for her presentation because she too has been a victim of trying to eliminate people of color uh, from uh, the process of empowerment and democracy. I yield back, Mr. Chairman, I thank you so very much. Thank you, Ms. Jackson Lee. Uh, are, do any of the members want a minute or so to either make a final statement or ask a final question or rebut anything or submit any new data? I, Mr. I, Raskin, you look like you're, you're pondering. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, forgive me, but I, I, I took note that some of our colleagues were talking about proxy voting. Again, I don't know what the specific context was, but uh, now a majority of both the, ma the majority in the House and a majority of the minority in the House have cast votes, uh, most of them repeatedly by proxy. And I know that there was, you know, a polemical attack on proxy voting uh, when the COVID-19 nightmare uh -huh. first began. But it seems like it's been well established uh, through practice. And there, there are no courts holding that we can't conduct proxy voting under our Article One power to define the rules of our own proceedings. So I, I think all of that is a little bit of a red herring and an irrelevant distraction from what we're here to talk about today. Uh, Mr. Baskin, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Roy and Mr. Johnson came back to the hearing. They had gone to vote on the floor, and I had noted that there were no Republicans to have as, as questioners, and they were uh, understandably, uh, in being in Washington, gone to vote. Mr. Johnson has suggested that they 
and I think he meant the Republicans didn't believe in proxy voting, and I had commented that they did, that they did participate, and that Mr. they had many Mr. instances. Mr. Chairman, if you'd like to respond. And yeah, I don't want to waste the committee's time on a topic that's tangential, but in response to my friend, James, or Congressman Raskin, um, look, I, I believe it's unconstitutional. I've not voted by proxy. That is true for a block of Republicans. I'm an equal opportunity basher of my colleagues when I think that they're doing something unconstitutional. And there are Republicans who speak with one voice and then still vote uh, by proxy. I disagree with them. My, all my, Mike's in the same camp, Johnson, I should say, uh, from Louisiana. And we uh, it puts us in an awkward spot. The more comfortable the body gets with proxy voting, then, for example, I had a speech at the University of Virginia, and I found myself, when we were voting on the infrastructure bill, sitting in Fredericksburg, waiting to be told, are we voting or not voting on the infrastructure bill? Because my vote might matter. So I literally sat in a coffee shop in Fredericksburg for three hours waiting to know whether I was going to Charlottesville or coming back to the Hill. I just don't think it's a great way to do business. Um, obviously, I made a choice that I don't be, I'm don't. i not going to give my vote to someone else. I just wanted to add some color to why that um, matters in my view. Thank you, Mr. Roy, and I, I appreciate that. And you and Mr. Johnson, I, I don't know that either of you have ever voted by proxy, but the appearance Mr. Johnson was making was as if Republicans didn't vote by proxy. And I have particularly noted, as Mr. Raskin mentioned, that now a majority of Republicans have at one time or another voted by proxy, including three or four people once who voted by proxy when they went to Mar-a-Lago to attend a fundraiser at, at Mr. Trump's uh, resort, uh, and not because of the reasons they're supposed to. But Mr. Roy, I hope you get to vote by uh, in person for many, many, many years as this, uh, this, this epidemic pandemic will be behind us. And you're not over 65 years old where the coronavirus is more dead. dead deadly. And then they, so for those of us over 65, uh, it's, we think this is a good idea, but regardless of that, anybody else have any, Mr. Yeah, Roe, when okay. I left you, you were, you were in a sand trap on the 17th hole and couldn't remember what you were trying to come up with and say, did you ever get out of the sand trap? Yeah, I, I did, but you know, we, the hearing has gone on and we've had a good conversation. I can do it. I mean, that all I was going to do was, but I'm not going to go there. We, we've had a good, we'll, we'll move on and move forward. I did. I appreciate the opportunity. We're, we're good, and, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Put your sandwich back in the back in the clubs in your in your in your bag. Uh, anybody else have anything? Mr. If Chairman. not, I want to thank all Mr. the witnesses. Chairman. Yes, Miss Lee, quickly. Yeah. Miss Butler, um, and Miss uh, and Congresswoman McBath. Miss Butler, are you there? I'm here. Yes, yes. Madam Congresswoman. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you so very much for your leadership uh, to both of you, um, both Congresswoman McBath. Could you give the extraordinary um, uh, impact on vulnerable voters, whether they're elders, whether they're young people, and they happen to be people of color, whether they're Hispanic or African-American, in the kind of a suppressive, oppressive uh, bill that you have? And Congressman McBath, would you just answer a simple fact? You represent that district. You're African-American woman. Uh, you did represent it well. Uh, in matching you in another district, do you think there was some uh, underlying uh, thought that they might eliminate an African American woman in the United States Congress. So, Ms. Butler, and then uh, Congresswoman McMahon. Thank you, Congresswoman uh, Jackson Lee. Thank you. Um, the undue burden, and I've talked about this, is with regards to vote by mail, where people have to provide IDs. Uh, a lot of older people don't have uh, the capacity to copy IDs because they don't have Georgia driver's license or state issued ID. Uh, the undue burden of out of precinct voting, that's a lot of things. If you don't know, a lot, a lot of people don't get their information timely. Uh, they can't vote out of precinct uh, before 5 p.m. So it puts undue burden on them. A lot of po polling locations, just as I stated earlier in my testimony, we were down in Lincoln County already where they wanted to consolidate uh, seven polling locations to one, giving no reason last night, according to the chair, and had no plan for making sure people would be able to do it. And 600 people signed a petition, both black and white, that said that they did not want that to happen. The other part is the unlimited amount of challenges 
that people can do to people's residency or their ability to vote uh, in this bill, voter suppression bill, uh, where it creates a hearing process uh, and um, three-day notice for voters to respond to protect their right to vote. The most egregious part, though, is the total takeover process of the entire election process from removing election supervisors, removing the Secretary of State uh, from his constitutional position as Thank chair you. of the State Election Board. So Thank those you. are some of the things. Thank you so I very much. Time, I think our time is up. I thank you, Ms. Jackson Lee and, and everybody else. We've had a great hearing. We've discussed a lot of issues and it's the importance and it is serious about the Voting Rights Act and, and the, the, the place where our democracy presently rests in jeopardy. And, I, and this committee continues to uphold civil rights and, and voting rights. We thank all the panelists, all the witnesses that have come before us. Uh, you, the committee members will have five days to submit, uh, legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses and, or additional materials for the record. Uh, so thank you for what you've all done and God bless the, the uh, United States of America and let's hope the filibuster does not kill democracy. I, uh, that the hearing is adjourned.